two of the Commonwealth Trade and Investment Summit 2022. Pleasure to see you all uh, bright and early. Well, not that early, but bright at least. Um, we've got a great morning lined up for you, a uh, great day. So, um, you know, buckle up. There's lots of content coming at you, great speakers. And uh, we are starting with one of the more important issues globally right now, the question of food security. Um, if you've somehow managed to avoid the news over the last 11 months, you'll know that food prices are soaring across the globe. Uh, in this country, food, food price inflation has hit 16.5%. That was back in October, and it's much worse in other parts of the world. So we're kicking off with a discussion around food systems, what's wrong with them, why is food security becoming more of an issue, and of course, the all-important question, of what we can do about it. Got a great lineup of speakers that will be joining me on stage shortly. We're kicking off with some introductory remarks by Dozi Mobosi. I think I got that name somewhat correct. He's the co-founder and CEO of Tingo. Dozi, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, Your Excellencies, um, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dozi Morbosi, and I'm um, the founder of Tingo Inc. Um, our company is a technology company, yes, but uh, we're all about food security. And that's why this um, topic is very important to me and to my company. And um, I thank the, the staff and um, also the other council members of the Commonwealth um, Investment um, Council. Um, and I'm looking forward to speaking, of course, with... Um, my other, the few people I've met here today. Um, I usually do not talk too much. I'm hoping to um, discuss further on this um, in the coming um, minutes, I believe. Thanks and welcome. Yeah. Very to the point. Thank you, Dozy. And uh, no, don't leave the stage. <laughs> Have a seat. And um, I'll uh, invite the rest of the panel up to, to join us. Uh, Minette Batters, who is the president for the National Farmers Union of England and Wales. Minette. <laughs> Martin Davies, he's the head of Naveen Natural Capital. <laughs> and Brett Graham a two-star Michelin chef, restaurateur, and owner of the Leadbury. All right. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining this discussion. Um, as I've just indicated, very topical, very important, and growing by, in importance by the day. Um, food security and agriculture is intertwined with sustainability intertwined with the challenge of climate change and uh, for some time now there has been a discussion globally about the need to change and reform and improve food systems. That has taken on, to put it mildly, renewed urgency in the wake of events in Ukraine which have demonstrated just how fragile global food systems are and what that means for everyone involved in the process from the producers to the distributors, to the retailers, and of course to the consumers who are having to pay more and more money. Um, it's bad enough in this country with food prices spiking in other parts of the world like Sub-Saharan Africa where the average citizen spends around 25% of their monthly income on food. You can just imagine what 30, 40, 50% plus food inflation does to, to, to a person and the knock-on effects of that. So, what we're going to do is um, have a bit of a discussion around where some of the key challenges are, some of the key problems, but of course also try to speak to the question of what can be done about it. To set the scene, I'm going to give um, our speakers an opportunity to introduce themselves, maybe provide a little bit more context on um, where they're coming from and how they are approaching the issue of food security and food systems. And um, we're going to do that by way of a fairly simple, but uh, I, I think kind of challenging question. 
I'll give you two or three minutes each, and um, it would be great if you can respond to the question and add any, kind of, any perspectives that you feel are really important or relevant to the conversation. Question is quite simple. What's wrong with food systems, and what can be done to fix them? Martin, you have the misfortune of sitting next to me, so um, <laughs> you get to go first. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I did think about sitting there, actually, and that was clearly my first mistake of the day. Uh, what's wrong with uh, global food systems? Well, I think there's a dysfunctionality which, is, which exists in food systems, which really comes from the way agriculture production is structured, uh, how food supply chains have developed, and how our consumers um, sit. So agriculture globally is a business activity which is in the hands of small, medium enterprises, smallholder farmers. It's very, very fragmented, but it doesn't matter what farm you are farming and where you're farming it, the likelihood is what you're producing is passing through the hands of a much, much smaller group of processors, uh, grain traders, exporters, um, and then at the other end, that reaches many, many consumers globally. So we have this pinch point um, in agricultural supply chains, which really causes, in my view, a significant dysfunctionality. Uh, the World Bank say that we need $350 billion of capital invested on an annual basis between now and 2035 uh, to deliver sustainable food systems. But of course, we're not just trying to solve the challenges of food security. Alongside that, we have to solve for um, a massive decline in biodiversity and environment across farmlands globally, and we also have to solve for climate change as well. Um, so the, the carbon efficiency of food production needs to increase fivefold, simple as that. We have to massively reduce the carbon footprint, and we have this dysfunctional model. So that, to me, is really at the root cause of the, the, the problem that we need to deal with. Um, I work in the investment industry, um, the business I run is owned by Teachers and Insurance Annuity Association of America. So we're providing retirement benefits for 5 million people working in the education sector. So we have a desire to try and invest in the locations where that 350 billion that I mentioned uh, is needed. But one of the fundamental things that we have to overcome is the risk appetite of some of the countries where the capital uh, is most desperately needed. So. I think I've sent, said enough there for a few opening remarks. Give somebody else an opportunity to comment. Thank you, Martin. So a um, couple of takeaways there is that the, the structure of global food systems and the supply chains are um, not fit for purpose. Uh, you didn't use the word, but uh, you know, what I was thinking is it sounds a bit like, it sounds like a bit of a cartel uh, around food systems. Uh, it might be a little bit controversial, <coughs> but very important observation there. We'll unpack that a bit more. Brett, your take on what's wrong and uh, how can we make it better? Yeah, um, my sort of view a bit more is a bit more domestic and based here. I'm a chef and um, I've got a couple of restaurants and also run a farming business. So I've been able to see over the last couple of years as I've tried to build the farming side of the business up, I've really seen both sides of, of what happens. I guess a big, a really simple way of me seeing it is that we need to offer less choice to everybody and we can't change um, and help impact and be more secure as a country producing food if we don't change. And you know the huge amount of, um, of choice I see in supermarkets for every single cut of meat or every single fruit and vegetable, there's times I think we need to sort of think about, you know, is it the worst thing in the world if we don't have you know, fillet steak available as well as ribeye, as well as sirloin, as well as every single um, sort of cut um, across the board and possibly you know one of the issues as well is we should be eating more seasonal and and and, and it's obviously a very complex subject but we've lost that sort of seasonality to all of our food now and you know every year every you know time someone goes to shop they of course they want to have the bananas and avocados and tomatoes in the middle of winter I think part of the change of where I see is um, is making that change, is making sure that that choice isn't too big and people don't expect those ingredients all year round. Simplest form. Thank you, Brett. So 
um, the need for changing consumption habits, yeah. um, and and also the kind of you know what is assumed to be necessary supply um, of food. Um, you know, I would have no problem with uh, less meat on the shelves. I'm not a meat eater, so uh, they could take it all down, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. But I know that's a minority opinion. So, uh, but I also see there's like a. I know it's a more complex problem that I'm probably sort of explaining it, but I don't understand why we maybe import a certain ingredient like lamb from New Zealand and then we start a trade deal and start selling it to America. And that doesn't really make sense to me. Right, so there's some market inefficiencies that you're pointing yeah. to there. Uh, Dozy, if you had to distill, what's yeah, wrong with okay. the system? Okay, thanks. I, 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 won't, I won't take it from this angle. I think um, politics is a problem first. Um, if you look at uh, Africa, where I come from, to be specific, Nigeria, the issue is the infrastructure. Um, before the produce gets to the market, 60% is rotten, so we have post-harvest losses. Um, our politicians are unable to provide the infrastructure. What some of us are doing with some of our other businesses is to buy up and then create um, you know, small processing plants in the locations, and then we begin to save these um, from tomatoes to yams to potatoes or whatever. Um, if you know, we were having a discussion earlier, and I said to myself, the reason I say politics is a problem is um, Nigeria, for instance, produces over 5 million tons of millet. And millet, they say, is healthier, healthier. It's a healthier version of um, wheat. And um, Ukraine produces, um, I guess, um, over 11 million tons of um, wheat or whatever. Why should um, one country, in the first instance, um, be the only or you know, monopolize the distribution of um, wheat? So I think the world needs to be a fairer, politicians need to be fairer, and I think um, governments from across the globe must begin to work together to find practical solutions to these problems. So if, imagine we have a, a proper food security council in the world consisting of um, leaders from across the globe, where you know that um, Africa has arable land, you know, land enough to produce food for the rest of the world, why should Africa not be given the opportunity to do so? Why should African leaders to not provide the kind of infrastructure to make food get to the marketplace? You know, so these are some of the things, and um, I hate to talk about statistics, but the real problem is, um, look, back in some countries in Africa, if we're talking about food security, we're talking of access, we're talking of nutrition, but nutrition to us here in the UK is, yeah, very important, but to some people in, in some parts of Africa, it's about filling their tummies. It's not about, they don't care about nutrition. So our definition of food security here is totally different. We come here, you know, speak all the English and go back home and we don't do anything about it. So I think it's high time we started, you know, to be practical about some of these problems. Someone asked me why, um, the, you know, the, the, the fancy charities from the US fail in, in, in Nigeria when they come to distribute um, polio vaccines. The reason is um, the communities do not trust them. You know, you need to work, you know, using practical, practical solutions, you know, work with the people on ground, and then you have your solution. So I think politics um, needs to be, we need to address how we do some of these things. You say you hate to talk about statistics. I, I love it, and I love to hear about statistics. Um, here's a worrying one for you. The FAO, that's the Food and Agriculture Organization, estimates that in sub-Saharan Africa, close to 25% of the population is malnourished. To your point that, uh, you know, nutrition means is, is, it, is, it, is it's a very- It's actually way more than that, right. trust yeah. me. So there you go. Uh, just to underline the severity of, of, of the problem and, uh, I think you've, you've touched on a, a very important dynamic, and this was a question that was going through my mind in uh, preparing for, for this session, is how is it that disruption in effectively one country in Europe has been able to basically upend global food supplies? Um, I am not an expert on food systems, but it tells me that, that it, something isn't quite right if it takes literally one country to go off the rails and suddenly across the globe people can't feed themselves. So um, we'll definitely get into some of that a bit more and also the political issue. Um, Minette, your, your thoughts. Oh, thank you. Well, very good morning, everyone. I um, represent 55,000 farmers across uh, England and Wales, and I would say that politics is the challenge the world over, really, for farmers. Um, 
look, some of you may have heard it on, on the news this morning. We have been calling for uh, a food security uh, target to be set by government. We face a massive food security crisis in this country if we don't act. We are seeing 320 million less eggs produced in this country than we were in 2019. Um, you talk about what has happened with the war in, in Ukraine, and, and rightly so. If we look at the price of gas, which ultimately affects every farmer in the world and every cost of food production, <clears throat> if we look at the UK, it's 650% higher than it was back in 2019. 650% higher. So that's a huge issue for a wealthy nation like the UK to have an environment whereby we continue to produce healthy, affordable, high quality food. So the war in Ukraine is, is a game changer. Those inflationary costs were building during the pandemic um, and they are now going to be baked in. And there is a huge issue if we are going to keep people in their countries and not allow a mass migration uh, to occur because people are, are literally searching for, for food. And that's going to be a big issue where political leaders will need to come together. And I was amazed, really, at COP27 in Egypt. Egypt massively impacted because it imports so much of its grain. 30% of global wheat is from Russia and Ukraine. Um, we're going to see enormous issues in North Africa if we don't come together. So it really is a, a time for action. I, I think the model is incredibly challenging. You raised the point about New Zealand lamb. That's a legal requirement that we took on uh, the EU TRQ, Trade Policy Dollars Ditch Water for many, but it's a legal requirement that we took it. So we import 40% of our lamb, we need to export 40% of our lamb, which is why it was going to the US. So it's very challenging. And before you know it, the two areas that you end up talking about are, let's take meat out of the diet, big pot tick box on climate change, does nothing, really damages Africa actually, which is very, very reliant on, on livestock farming. It's about where you produce it in the world. And if we don't say take meat out of the diet, we say, well, people have just got to pay more for their food. That doesn't deal with the issue either. So those two things, forget them because they do not deal with the problem. And we really do need to come together. We are part of the World Farmers Organization, which literally at the table has European farmers the US, the Canadians, uh, Australians, New Zealanders, and many African subsistence farmers from across the whole of Africa. Now, that's really difficult to keep them in the room. But I promise you, at the FAO, there was no global discussion on food security. And the only way we've been able to achieve that globally is to get a seat at the table on the World Food Security Committee through the WFO. And we have to keep representing the voice of all farmers across the world. If we allow the world to be run by, by a few, it will never deal with the whole problem. And we have, I think, a lot of opportunity now uh, in the challenge of global feeding and global warming. We can exchange knowledge like never before. When I was out in Zambia, I had a better phone signal in Zambia than I do here, anywhere here. So we can exchange knowledge in a way that we couldn't. So I would love to think that the UK could really be a global leader in climate smart agriculture in how we do produce carbon neutral food, feed a growing world population and deal with the enormous challenge of climate change. Farmers are the solution and not the problem. Thank you, Minette. Um, Martin wants to follow up on this, but before he does, just a, a couple of take, takeaways there. Um, first of all, it is quite worrying, if not shocking, to hear that despite the fairly self-evident uh, urgency of the problems surrounding food systems and the, um, the knock-on effects on the cost of living, the, the link to energy that you've, that, that you've articulated, climate change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that there isn't much of a conversation going on in a place like COP27 around food security, that to me, Pardon the colloquial term, but that sounds kind of bonkers. Um, so, you know, I can only echo your sentiment of we need to come together, and the means to do so have never been more effective, but of course, um, easier said than done. Martin, you wanted to, to pick up the thread. Yeah, I, I just wanted to pick up on the point about meat eating, and um, I'm not a vegetarian, Minette. I, I like a good steak like everybody else, but 
I think there's a really important point there in the, and, and Brett mentioned that, a, a lot of food security ultimately is going to come back to consumer choice and, and what we, uh, the conscious decisions that we make. So in the Northern Hemisphere, we consume too many calories. Most of us, it, it's quite evident that we consume too many calories. So we need to eat, we need to eat less, we need to eat less meat. I'm not advocating that we shouldn't eat meat at all, but that really starts um, at, a, at a consumer level. And one of the things which to me is really important from a food security perspective is leadership within the agricultural sector, leadership and education. So education flows right the way down to the consumer and I don't know that the average consumer in the UK or anywhere globally realizes that by 2050 we need to increase uh, at the current trajectory calorie production by 56%, protein production by 100%. And that's using the WRI's recalibrated information, um, looking at reduced calorie consumption in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. So we all have to make a choice and we all have to take decisions which ultimately will contribute to some of the food security issues that we have. We should have a stake at the Farmers Club at some time in it. Can I just have a quick pushback? I, I just find it bizarre that we come back to meat. I mean, the reason we're all getting fatter is actually because we're eating too much sugar and too many biscuits and too much processed food, which doesn't have any meat in it. So you can have unsustainable meat and you can have unsustainable plant-based and grain-based. And it's because we're eating too much processed food, grain and meat in some areas, that's the problem. And it's, it's just very frustrating. You've articulated a good point, but some people weaponize it. And there is a toxic tour de force, effectively, that is doing, I think, a lot of damage to thinking if you take meat and dairy out of a diet, you tick the box on climate change. And actually, what we ought to do is get rid of almond milk, and that would do a, a lot on the challenges of, of climate change. So it's, it's a flawed argument, and it takes away what we actually need to be doing. Because you can have unsustainable both, and they're both damaging, and eat less processed food, and eat more lentils and fruit and veg, which none of us eat enough of. <laughs> I, I, Sorry, I, I wish in, in, in some parts of um, my country we could um, have this kind of debate you know, about processed food. And uh, see, there's what they call 101. In some villages in, in my country, people eat cassava in the morning and cassava in the night. It, it's not even a discussion whether there is meat or whether there is, um, you know, whatever in it. You know, so this is the balance I'm talking about. I think we need to be more serious about this situation because people will begin to cross whatever seas to go to Europe or to come to the UK or to go wherever. So if we want to be serious about these things, Africa doesn't need charity. We're talking about collaboration here. I, I, I have about um, over 10 million customers, smallholder farmers that my company um, deals with. But and I'm not even speaking for them, but I know what they feel. Credit, access to credit, for instance, even when the banks go to take credit from you know, the UK and other development finance institutions, I know the kind of conditions they get. So interest rate back in my country is almost 30%. How can a farmer survive on that? You know, so if the world is serious about these things, if we're worried, bothered about food security or, you know, the UK, you know, having crisis of, you know, food security, we need to then begin to collaborate with um, financial institutions, you know, other businesses, you know, across Africa to find practical solutions. Of course, government too, governments across Africa. We can't continue to just um, talk, you know, when credit is, um, we, we lack credit in, in, in Africa, in Nigeria. You know, we need to begin to look at very practical um, solutions here. Um, you know, I, I have nothing against, um, you know, the beef and, um, you know, processed food, but, you know, that is the real situation um, there. Yeah. Brett, did you want to comment on this or? Yeah, I think, um, again, I just think a lot of it comes down to so much choice that we have, you know, as we've got, you know, if I even remember, wasn't, you know, when I was a boy, my parents would go out for dinner once every two or three months. And now I think it's accepted that we can go out for dinner four or five times a week, just as a normal way of life. And, you know, from supermarkets to restaurants to all those things, we just consume so much. And we want something from everything. You know, we you go to a restaurant, you could eat 15 different dishes from 15 different parts of the world. 
And, um, and like I'm only referencing my experience here in England because it's where I've spent most of my professional career. But I've seen that grow so much and, and we do need to change yeah. and do make our food systems smaller, that sort of chilled transport chain smaller and tighter and, um, and concentrate more on what we're growing here. And, you know, uh, one of the things I've, I've got some uh, for pigs and one of the, the farmers I work with had come out of big, big commercial unit producing, you know, 15,000 pigs a year. And I looked on his, uh, his, his sheet the other day and it was the, the price per kilo that he was getting for his sows was, was 75p a kilo. And, um, you know, most sparkling waters double that price in the shops. So I don't understand how that happens. And then I don't understand why we don't eat it in this country and we send it off to Germany and they make hot dogs out of it and sell it back to us. And so I think we need to look within a little bit and see how we can process the food that we eat here in this country. And I don't understand why we can't make sausages here and send it abroad to get it made and then buy it back. So a, a few thoughts from my end. Uh, first, Martin, I'm not a vegetarian either. I do eat seafood and nothing against vegetarians, by the way, um, for any of those in, in the audience. Uh, Minette, I'm glad you made the point that it's sugar that's the problem. I couldn't agree more. Um, there's a lot of misconception around why it is that um, obesity is becoming an increasing problem. And it is processed foods without any doubt whatsoever. Um, but also, uh, Martin, I do agree that, um, and, and Brett, that I think, and this, this may sound a bit contentious, but I mean, people kind of eat, eat a bit too much. We, we don't need to eat as much as, uh, as is commonly assumed. Um, I, I'd like to pick up on this, this issue of, <sighs> The voice of farmers kind of going unheard, Minette. That, that's something that, that you put out there. And uh, Martin, you had a similar experience that you were recounting earlier. You were at the UN General Assembly in New York and you were in a, in a, uh, participating in a session that was dedicated to empowering farmers and uh, there were no farmers in the room. Uh, Counterintuitive to say the least. Um, what is happening here? I mean, like, can you tr break this down a little bit? Why are we talking so much about farmers and not actually listening to what farmers have to say? Because if, surely if anyone knows what's happening in terms of food production, the starting point should be the farmer. Minette, Martin? Look, yeah, you're absolutely right. I was really struck the other day. I, we're a political organization, so I, I meet with anyone and everyone, and you never know who you'll be working with next, is, is probably what I would say. But I had a meeting with Sir Tony Blair. He really summed it all up. He said, I've always found farming really difficult to understand. What's the one thing you want? I said, well, it's not one thing. I've probably got a list of 20 things, and that doesn't even start to cover the sides of it. So it's really challenging, even within one country, as to what we want from farmers. And we've got many, many, you know, I represent 55,000. In Africa, you know, it's, it's a huge part of the infrastructure of, of many parts of Africa, subsistence farming. So it's very complex, I think, as to how we resolve this trade. I'm an ambassador of Farm Africa, which has been an amazing charity in Eastern Africa that has allowed farmers to trade. Um, particularly um, if I look at what we've done with coffee. And, and that has allowed investment to come in, that has allowed clean water, education, sustainability, all because they have access to a market. So there's a lot of things. It's very easy that we end up talking about all the things that are wrong rather than all the things that are right. And actually, if we talk about all the things that are right, that ultimately leads to change as to, as to what needs to, to happen. But I think having that voice heard is probably the biggest issue. And, and COP27 spoke volumes in that the voice of farming wasn't heard. And it amazes me, you know, we're having a conversation between the three of us. You are rightly talking about people who it's about food. It's about filling your stomach. You're not fussed whether it's processed, unprocessed, meat, vegetable, as long as you have something to eat. And yet in wealthy parts of the world, we just take it for granted. We waste the equivalent of a continent we waste the equivalent of China in food. That's how mad it is. There is enough food, but there's a real issue on distribution. So we cannot allow the voice to continue to be unheard um, because otherwise global warming is gonna 
drive changes that will make many parts of the world uninhabitable. And, you know, we've got to feed this growing population. So I, I really hope that what has happened in the Ukraine, the atrocities, the horrific nature of it, will be a game changer globally. Wouldn't it be great if we had a different conversation about global food security on the back of that horrendous situation? Uh, Dozy, on that point, oh, Martin, would, would, would you like to comment on this? But I want to pick up that thread with you, Dozy. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, Martin, go, okay, go Martin, for it first, and I'll come back to you. Yeah. yeah. So I, I was relating the story there about the UN General Assembly, but I, I've been to the, the Committee on Food Security in Rome on quite a few occasions, and again, unfortunately, farmers are just not represented in October each year where food security is one of the principal topics of discussion. The reality is farmers like farming, and no offence to any politicians in the room, they're not really that keen on engaging with politicians. Minette probably is. Um, so there's, there's a real issue with leadership in the sector. Who is representing the smallholder farmer in Nigeria in the issues that they face? What, what can solve the issues that they face? So we really do need to encourage leadership and development of people to actually represent farmers because not all smallholder farmers can turn up at, in, in Rome at the, the FAO and talk about global food security. Um, so it's a cultural thing. And of course, it varies a lot when you look across the globe. But to me, that's a critical thing that we need to solve for. I'm involved in an organization called Nuffield International. It's a great organization that, that tries to develop leadership um, in the agricultural sector globally. And that, that's what we need. We need farmers to get into the environment, to have a seat at the table, uh, describe what their challenges are, what the practical solutions are, um, and, and only I think in any food supply chain, the only way you're going to solve the, the problems that that food supply chain has is by having collaboration with everybody who's involved in the, in the food supply chain, right the way from the primary producer all the way to the food re retailer at the, the top end of that chain, and indeed the consumer as well. Uh, Dozy, picking up on, on the, the point that uh, Minette made around I events in Ukraine being enough of a shock to the system to kind of change the game in terms of the conversation we're having on global f food security. Um, my sense is that there's a little bit of that happening in the African context. So places like the African Development Bank, they have, they have really started pushing the idea that, look, we need, to, we, we need to just up production locally and on the continent. I believe they've set up a $1.5 billion fund it's obviously not going to fix the problem. Um, do you think that that's an, there's an opportunity here to maybe redefine the parameters? Are you seeing any evidence of that? Absolutely. Um, you see, the thing with Africa is, um, let me use Nigeria as, um, you know, 90% of those producing food are smallholder farmers. You know, so the, the Dangote farms and, you know, some of us own some big farms, you know, but um, the smallholder farmers are the core. Um, they do not have access to the kind of credit um, the African Development Bank is going to give. So what happens is the AFDB gives credit you know, to the commercial banks in Nigeria and then they give it to their friends. So it never gets to them. Some of us also now have businesses that are giving inputs and um, credit to, microcredit to these farmers. The practical solution is to deal directly with them. One of the things we have done now, there is um, the biggest um, association of farmers in Nigeria called AFAN, All Farmers Association of Nigeria, over 20 million members. We've now taken them on and we are beginning to onboard them, you know, to do what we have done in the last um, decade with over 9 million farmers, you know, using, giving them access to markets, inputs, of course, extension services. And of course, um, credit is very key to, to this. We cannot, to be very realistic, we cannot depend on um, the Africa Development Bank. Um, we are now beginning to even set up our own agricultural bank because that has to be the solution. You know, um, I see myself as an agribusiness entrepreneur, so it's not just about tilling the soil. It's, you know, so that is my constituency, the, the farmers. And the way to go about representation of farmers is, um, that's why I'm also here ranting in a very subtle way. And, um, trying to talk some common sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, I, appreciate, I appreciate the common sense and the honesty. Um, it's refreshing. Um, 
a lot of the, the discussion we're having, for me, what's, what's standing out is that there's sort of just kind of decisions being made that don't really make sense. Um, systems are operating in a way that that isn't quite fit for purpose. And the, the word that, that, you know, that comes to mind is that the world kind of needs to get smarter about how it produces food, distributes food, consumes food. Um, and Dulcie, sticking with you on this, one of the, one of the potential game changers, and you know, I, I, I approach this topic carefully because I don't want to you know, be naive about it, but technology and the application of technology to the agriculture sector is something that could potentially um, address some of these issues, right? Minette, you made the point earlier that, you know, it's never been as possible to access knowledge and information and share. And of course, Tingo is in the business of, of agri-tech. Um, could you give us your take on how technology might fit into this picture and might make for smarter systems? Well, um, technology clearly is um, a core part of um, solving this um, problem. Um, you know, what we have seen, or the opportunity we have seen as a company is um, we have taken technology, and very simple technology, because these guys don't need um, sophisticated technology or complex technology. Technology that must solve problems. As simple as um, building smartphones that they can understand and providing connectivity so that they can trade. It's not just about chatting on, on, um, on, on community platforms. I don't want to mention any of these um, community platforms. It's about localizing what they, they need, not what they want. So we're using smartphones as a technology you know, to be in their hands. Banks are not in the villages, so the smartphones are everywhere. And uh, banking or f fintech applications um, for financial inclusion are right there. So they're able to do that. So it's not about even, of course, you have tractors. Tractors, of, of course, um, you need tractors to be available. But it's not just about tractors. But it's, um, you know, these smallholder farmers can farm the way they, they know how to farm best. And when they harvest, they just need to sell to sustain their lives. So I think um, what we are doing as a business is the solution, you know, providing that technology to give them access to um, finance, access to markets so that they can survive. For now, at this stage, it's about survival. Then at the macro level, we can begin to talk about um, export um, for Nigeria to diversify from you know, oil and gas, for instance, which is, I, I don't say that as bad, but we need to begin to diversify. You know, so that's uh, at that level. So of course, technology is, um, is the core, you know, but very simple technology, yeah. not um, technology that... Um, not yeah. AI algorithms or... No. Right. No. So I mean, access to markets and access to credit, right? Two yeah. key, key issues. Um, would anyone like, else like to, to, to come in on this? Um, smarter systems, the need to kind of just be smarter about the process. Well, I think you make a really important point on you know, the role of, of innovation and the ability to share it. And a really good example of that would be actually what the UK set out to achieve in 2011, which was to be a global leader in antimicrobial resistance on, on the back of the world facing an apocalypse that we will not have the antibiotics to deal with future infections. And a lot of this is the role of um, use of antibiotics in the livestock sector and the ability now to be able to share you know, if, if we are sick and we need antibiotics, you know, we know now that we have to take antibiotics very seriously and very differently to how we treated ourselves in the past. It's exactly the same with livestock production. We have to use much less antibiotics. And we have, in this country in the last decade, we have lowered antibiotic usage by over 50%. That's, that's a massive plus for every single person in this room. And we now have the ability as you have said, through the smartphone, we can share all of that technology, all of that innovation that is coming online as to how we, how we farm with a much lighter footprint, effectively, but one that delivers. That's just a really good example of something that will transform human health. And we mustn't ever lose sight of all of that. I think we focus so much on affordability of food and how cheap food is. I have faced into so many conversations about, oh, we just want to have cheaper food. Well, no, we want everybody to have better food and, and things like antimicrobial resistance, 
that, that really should be a big global discussion, and so often it's not. And the UK has provided enormous leadership on the back of what Lord O'Neill did in 2011. So, so don't let things like that sort of not get heard again, because most people won't know anything about that, and they should. And we can share all of that now with farmers right across the world. That's brilliant for human health, but it's brilliant for animal health too. Martin. Yeah, so we have some just monumental challenges to face globally in the agricultural sector, but I think we can take heart in the fact that we have technology which can help us solve a lot of the problems. So whether it be virtual reality, or augmented reality, robotics, artificial intelligence, remote sensors, drones, and so on. Because of the nature of agriculture, it's primary production, it's dependent on the weather, the interaction of the plant, the animal with its environment, it lends itself to the impact of technology. So technology is a game changer, but technology needs investment. And I go back to the point I made that the World Bank say agriculture needs $350 billion on an annual basis. So the population of Nigeria in 2100, I think is 750 million. That's what the FAO say anyway, so it must be right. Um, so with that level of population growth, the, the productivity of the farmers in Nigeria, so there's, there's some structural things, there's policy, but you need the availability of that technology to get beyond that basic level of calorie production and then to increase productivity. Technology means that we're less reliant on synthetic inputs. The title of this panel was Resilience. If we're reliant on synthetic inputs, we, we don't have a great deal of resiliency in what we do because Minette made the point about fertilizer and, and, and gas prices and alike. Um, yeah, so we have to adopt technology as quickly as we can and it's, it's a game changer, but we need that because we have monumental challenges to face. Uh, Brett, we're soaring comfortably at around 30,000 feet to, to kind of bring this, bring this a little bit um, more down to earth. Um, what's, what are you seeing in terms of the kind of direct impact that the cost of living crisis that we're seeing is having on, um, on individuals like you? people who are in, you know, day to day in the business of farming, the business of feeding people. Um, is it having much of an impact? How are you having to respond? How's the, the wider industry um, that you're in having to respond to what's happening? To give us a, a bit of a sort of tangible sense of what it all means. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, my restaurant's a fancy restaurant and, you know, it hasn't really been affected, I guess, by the cost of living crisis, um, which is directly correlated to our clients. But the, the price of everything, as you all know, has gone up. Uh, we've had to respond to staff shortages like every industry probably has. I'm not quite sure which country the staff have gone to, but everyone <laughs> I speak to around the world has got no staff. Um, and, uh, and, and that's hard. And, and I guess what, what we do in the, I guess, retail sector in terms of a restaurant or a shop or whatever, we respond to those challenges by putting our prices up um, because we have to, otherwise we don't survive. I think the problem with that I've looked at into the farming side of things you just asked about is how do we redress a problem where farmers are speculating a year or two or three years in advance and then getting paid on a volatile market that is set by other people because they just wait to see what they get. And sometimes it works in their favor, like probably arable farmers are celebrating this year with some sort of high prices, but they might not be celebrating next year when their inputs have just doubled or tripled and they're not gonna see what that market's going to present to them. Um, and, and then looking probably on the farming side a bit more is with the trade, with how we trade with other countries and how supermarkets and, and retailers buy ingredients from other countries. And sometimes those countries have environmental and um, agricultural standards that would be illegal here. And then we're using those countries to drive the price down for farmers that are producing here. I think that's slightly unfair and maybe there's a way on net, you probably know far, far better than me, how we can address that issue where there's a level playing field for producers who produce in a certain country using chemicals that are, uh, are legal here um, and, um, and farming practices which are, are definitely not, wouldn't even come close to the agricultural standards we set out for our farmers to follow in this country. And so we're at a disadvantage here when we start trading against countries who maybe offer a cheaper price to produce the same product, but we have to, by law, do it in a different way. 
So maybe you've got a better idea than me about that. But I just thought that seems to be a really strong issue that farmers are going to face going forward. Huge issue. Fairness, level playing field, uh, you know, is, is what has to happen, but it's, it's very difficult to, to achieve. And, and, you know, the power within supply chains, I mean, the retailers here in the UK are enormously powerful. Um, you know, it's illegal for me to talk about price. I've had our legal team lecturing me all morning, do not talk about price in the media. In America, totally different competition law, they can talk about price routinely. We can't talk about price. So there's, there's massive issues that you refer to about how we establish a level playing field in all of this. Martin. Yeah, that, that's a more general problem is equitable distribution of what a food supply chain makes at the various points in the supply chain. So as I was diligently doing my research for this panel, there was a, a report literally only released last week, I think it was by Sustain, and it, it's entitled Unpicking the Food Supply Chain. So this is UK related, but a farmer in the UK who's producing milk that goes into cheddar is receiving 0.02% profit margin on the milk that they're producing. A farmer producing beef burger, um, well, Minette, you'll definitely be eating it. I'm not sure that we will. 0.03% um, margin. Bread, 0%. Apples, 1%. So now, if you think about a supply chain, who is taking most of the risk in the, in the supply chain? It's the primary producer. So why is this such an unequitable distribution of um, the margin in that supply chain? And that's not UK, that's everywhere you go. And, and this is the point I go back to at the start. You've got a disconnection between many, many farmers and many, many consumers. And there's a piece in the middle which is a constriction in how that supply chain functions. And we need to try and use technology to connect consumers more closely with farmers, maybe that's possible through blockchain or maybe it's less sophisticated things that, that, than that. But I do believe that ultimately some of this does come down to consumer choice and preference. We have uh, 10 minutes left and um, this being the Commonwealth Trade and Investment Summit, we have to bring in the Commonwealth um, and the extent to which as a group of countries, a, fam a family of countries, the Commonwealth can, um, can be at least part of the solution here. Um, pretty, pretty big question. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on how, how the Commonwealth might be able to catalyze some of the action that we need to see? Uh, we, we've got uh, you know, the English and uh, Farmers Union of England and Wales next to a tech entrepreneur from Nigeria in, in the agri-tech space. Um, there seems to be some obvious synergy there. Any thoughts? Well, um, for me, the, the Commonwealth is supposed to be about um, Commonwealth for you know member states. Um, I, I think uh, we need to do more. Um, the movement of um, goods and people, I feel it's still not very fair. You know, um, people can't move from Nigeria to the UK freely. Um, goods can't move from Nigeria to the UK freely. We need to be um, talking about that now. So if, if, if um, the UK can easily, of course I know there are standards and I know that there are companies who meet the standards. Um, all the certifications are available in Nigeria, but I'm still wondering why we don't find easily um, made in Nigeria food on the shelves here in the UK. I live here in London, but of course I, I don't go to the stores myself, but um, I know they are not really available. Um, because when I send um, when I send my house manager to look for these things, I have to go to a proper African store to get food. You know, because that's all I eat here in the UK. Um, so we need to do more about um, movement of humans and um, and goods. So if really we're Commonwealth, I think that's what we should be doing. Appreciate the honesty, Martin. So the only two Commonwealth countries that I invest in are Australia and New Zealand. They are agriculturally very advanced with adoption of technology and one of the things which you see every place you go to, farmers learn very well off other farmers and I think one of the things that the Commonwealth should really have the aspiration to do is to, we've been talking about the impact of technology, 
Um, we should really try and have some ambition to have sharing of best practice across uh, Commonwealth countries because I acknowledge the fact that subsistence farming in sub-Saharan Africa and, and incidentally I've never met a farmer anywhere who likes to be a subsistence farmer so non-government organisations start need to stop thinking that that's an important way for farming to exist but we need to try and encourage sharing of best practice information technology adoption across the Commonwealth. Um, maybe there are ways that the countries like the UK can uh, take a lead in that, but to me that's one of the things that I don't think enough um, of that happens, quite honestly. I've just been given the uh, signal that we need to wrap up. So, um, closing remarks. Uh, I want to give each of you just uh, 30 seconds or so. If there's one key message you want to put out to the room and beyond the room, uh, what is that key message? I mean, I feel like we've touched on some of those, but if you could just distill down um, one key issue when it comes to food security and resilience in food systems, what would that be? Any volunteers? Yeah? Minute. <laughs> <laughs> and you did it again. You did the one key issue, and I said I will have 20. That's, uh, that's, that's, that in itself is a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> And, and therein lies the challenge, that there is, there is no one thing, but there is, there is a lot of things that, I mean, I think everybody in this room, from every country, continent that you are from, we share an ambition that we, we have to come together and, and do it differently. So it is, it is about hearing the voice of farmers. Within the FAO now, on the World Food Security Committee, uh, farmers do have a voice. It's the only time they've had a voice uh, previous to um, four years ago was when they got their voice. Previous to that, the world's farmers had no voice at the World Food Security Committee at all, and they do now. So I think things are changing, and I think events are going to force change. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the big difference now. So politically, you know, it's interesting that, you know, Rishi Sunak in August committed to a new food security self-sufficiency target a legal framework to underpin it. No prime minister since the Second World War has done that in the UK. Now, it has to happen. That was August, this is now, and we've had a prime minister in between. Um, so events are going to change things. Um, but I guess what I would leave everybody thinking is just do not take your food for granted. I think you see stark difference in this panel with those that can never take food for granted and never know where the next meal's coming from and we just waste so much of it because it is so cheap. And raising food prices here is not gonna deal with the issue, but just value, value your food because we can buy it 24 seven, you can buy whatever you want, whenever you want. I mean, that is amazing. And if you go back to 1947, we were only 30% self-sufficient. So, you know, food matters and don't take it for granted. And together, I think as Commonwealth countries, we can drive change. Very quickly, because uh, we are up against the clock. Dozy? Okay, I'll be very brief. Um, I, I think we all need to go home and um, think again about what we've said here, the politicians in the room. I think I'm going to pass it on to you. Uh, we, need to be, do, we need to do better. Oh, you guys need to do better. I'm not a politician. Um, so that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Dozy. Yes. I, I guess on my side, just a final remark would be that no matter what country we're in, I think we need to support the people who actually make the food. You know, and there's, we can talk about all the other big issues, but if we get back to grassroots and support those who wake up every morning when we're still in bed and go and feed their animals and tend to their crops and whatever else they have to do uh, all day, every day, um, they're the ones that we need to reward. Great, and Martin? Well, to, to, to follow on from that point, those farmers need capital to invest in their business to, to improve the efficiency of what they do. So politicians, government, please work to try and find ways in which investors can come, overcome some of the risk perception that they have for investing in the countries where capital is needed most. I work in the investment industry. I want to invest in agriculture because it's not correlated with the economic cycle. It's an inflation hedge low volatility returns over time, 
But if I talk to the average pension fund who I manage capital for, they say, oh, I don't like the risk profile of that particular country. And the only way you overcome that is by government, politicians, a collaboration to find measures to deal with the, the risk profile and get to a risk appetite level that your average investor is happy with. Thank you. Um, to sum up very briefly, big topic, complex, difficult, a lot of moving parts to it. Um, two messages that really resonate. I think what Minette said is don't take your food for granted, couldn't agree more. But also that um, one way or the other, I think there, is, uh, there are significant forces afoot globally right now that are going to force some changes, whether we like it or not, whether the politicians like it or not, be that climate change, be that what we're seeing happening in Ukraine, be that migration. Um, this issue isn't going to go away. Um, prepare for more. I hope that we have provided some food for thought, pardon the pun, and a little bit of insight into what is going on in global food systems and how they might improve. Please join me in thanking the panel for the discussion. Now, I, uh, I kindly ask you to remain seated. We're going to change up the stage here. Uh, David Cameron, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, is going to be up on stage, so you'll want to hang around for that. Please do stay in your seats. Thank you. Of course, this is a man who needs no introduction. Some people call him David, some people call, him, call me Dave. But uh, he, uh, I've had the pleasure of introducing him in many guises myself, not in guises for himself, as leader of uh, the opposition and then prime minister. Uh, it was 15 years, no, 17 years ago, almost to today, that you became leader of the Conservative Party. Is that right? right that is correct. It was, and I remember the frenetic time, because at that point I was treasurer of the Conservative Party of when we chose uh, him as our great leader, and then he made the mistake of asking me to stay on as treasurer. <laughs> uh, so we've known each other, and I've had the privilege of knowing him for quite some time. Now I've, he's got a bit of time on his hands. His tennis has improved so much I can play with him, because in the old days I wouldn't, of course, because he hadn't been practicing enough. Now his Tennis is brilliant, so I have the great pleasure of seeing him a lot, and it's really kind of you, David, to come and address this audience here on such an important issue uh, of the fragile states, which I know is so close to your heart, and then when you've had a few words, perhaps we can explore great. a bit more. Thanks, Thank Dave. You. Thank you very much. Um, 
Well, thank you, Jonathan. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, I had a bit of a shock this morning. There's a feature on Radio 4 between, I think, Tweet of the Day and Farming Today when they say what happened on this day in the past. And actually, it is 17 years ago today that I was elected um, leader of the Conservative Party. I was then leader of the Conservative Party for 11 years, and in the six years since I left, quite a lot seems to have happened. But we're not going to talk about that today. I'm here to talk about um, fragile states um, and the work I'm doing on that issue. Um, but I just want to say what an enormous supporter of the Commonwealth I am. I was very proud as Prime Minister to attend three Commonwealth heads of government meetings um, in Australia, in Perth, in Sri Lanka and in Malta. And I was very proud to secure for Britain the right to host the 2018 Chogham. And obviously sad that I wasn't uh, in the chair when that happened, but I think it was a great um, success. Now what I want to talk about today is this um, issue of state fragility, fragile states. And I just want to address it really, why, why me, and why now? I think we all know what this issue is about. It's not about listing a number of countries that suffer from this. It's about understanding there's a set of circumstances that go together that cause some countries to be incredibly fragile. They're often affected by conflict, They're often affected by deep poverty. They tend to have weak institutions. There tends to be very little consent amongst the people for those institutions. There tends to be very high levels of corruption. Um, there tends to be a very low tax base and very incapable governments of doing things for their populations. And I spent about a year after leaving office on a commission of inquiry into this issue of state fragility with leading academics from Oxford and LSE and <coughs> elsewhere. And uh, I, I think it's incredibly important because if we are going to try to meet the sustainable development goals, if we're going to try and tackle global poverty, we have to address this issue of state fragility. And I got so involved in it because the longer I was Prime Minister, the more I could see that this issue of state fragility was stopping the progress of tackling poverty in so many parts of the world. And the figures bear this out. Pretty soon, more than half of the poorest people in the world will be living in so-called fragile states. Why? Because as India and China and the bigger countries grow and lift their populations out of poverty, we will find more of the world's poorest stuck in these countries and stuck in these states of fragility. And the point I always make uh, to an audience is to say there's not only a moral case for dealing with corruption, for helping build stronger institutions, for helping to tackle poverty. There's not only a moral case for helping countries escape conflict. There's a deeply practical case that if we don't do these things, then the problems that are caused, whether it is terrorism or migration or climate change, those things would affect us right here it, at, at home. So there's a deeply practical case um, for action. Uh, and I think we also have to accept that what we have been doing for the last 20, 30 years in the case of fragile states haven't, hasn't been working. And yes, more people have been lifted out of poverty in the last 30 years than ever before in global history. That's an amazing success story. But of course, that doesn't include the people stuck in the most fragile situations. That's why fragile states, states, why me? Well, of course, it's not just me. I'm chairman of the Commission for State Fragility, but I chair it alongside two brilliant African leaders, Donald Kabaruka, who was the finance minister in Rwanda and has run the African Development Bank, and Ellen Sirleaf Johnson, who was the visionary president of Liberia and done so much to help that country. We're backed by Oxford and the London School of Economics. We have experts in business like Dejan Tian and all his experience from uh, the Ivory Coast. We have diplomats like Lakdar Brahimi. We have former ministers from the Yemen. We have aid experts from Pakistan. It is an all-star cast, so it is certainly not just me. But having said that, I am proud of the record I have on development on these issues. 0.7% of GDP given in aid payments. That happened on my watch. Record amounts of money into climate finance on my watch. 67 million extra children vaccinated against totally preventable diseases 
on my watch, five million more girls going to school, and of course initiatives on FGM and on things like family planning, where Britain led the world. I'm not going to get involved in political controversy today. I try and avoid that, but uh, I was sad to see the demise of DFID. It was a world leader. I was sad to see that we're not achieving our 0.7% in uh, aid payments, but I am pleased that the government has seen the sense of having a minister responsible for development at the cabinet table, and in my view, they couldn't have chosen a better one than Andrew Mitchell. And so Britain, once again, can lead on these issues as we have done for the last few decades. Now, before I submit myself to a bit of a grilling by Jonathan Marland, I want to answer this question, why now? Why do I think this issue is so powerful right now? Well, of course, you've got the effect of the pandemic and the afterburn of that in fragile states. You've got the consequences of Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine in terms of higher food prices and higher energy prices. So you've got something of a triple whammy that is hitting many um, African countries and other fragile states. Higher food prices, higher fuel prices, and of course less aid payments because Western aid is being diverted into helping Ukrainian refugees rather than going to the fragile countries that need our help. But I would argue that even more than that triple whammy, there's actually something more profound that we need to understand. And I think what, the way I'd put it is to say that when we look at our record of failure in terms of helping fragile states, it's not that we need to change some of the things that we do some of the time. I would argue we need to change almost all of the things we've been doing all of the time. Let me give you four or five examples of what I mean. We've tended to think in development that what very poor and fragile countries need is a large, comprehensive program covering every element of their needs. Our research found that was absolutely wrong and the wrong idea. If you come up with some huge, Western-orientated, comprehensive plan, it completely overwhelms the capacity of the recipient country to deliver that program. You're much better off doing a smaller package of smaller things to try and build some successes. Crucially in development, and when you're dealing with a fragile state, is you want it to be their program, their priorities, their success. The problem is a lack of legitimacy. The people don't trust the government. They see the government as incapable. And if all they see is aid agencies and donor countries come in, pouring money and ideas in, but setting that government up for failure, you haven't solved the problem. Legitimacy is the problem, consent is the problem, and so the traditional way of a massive program doesn't tend to work. Second thing, we've always thought perhaps aid agencies, NGOs, donor governments had the expertise and should lead. No, I think that is wrong. It just sets the country up to fail. Third thing we've tended to think is the, the multilateral development banks, the development finance institutions, they do a pretty good job. We should just allow them to carry on and do that job, including in fragile states. Again, wrong. If you're a fragile state affected by conflict, affected by war, affected by corruption, huge infrastructure projects are probably not going to work and may easily favor one area, one tribe, one group of people, rather than the whole country. The real need in these situations is actually not for those sorts of large projects, it is for more economic activity. It's for more equity rather than more debt. It's for smaller projects rather than larger projects. It's for decentralized energy and off-grid solutions rather than massive power stations that become a new source of conflict. So that's another thing we need to change. There tends to be the argument that wherever we go and work, why don't we try and work with the people who are most sympathetic uh, to the development of the aid and the progress we want to see? Again, I think that is completely wrong. If you go back over the last 30 years, we've tried to help the Yemen without including the Houthi. We tried to help Iraq without including the Ba'ath Party. We tried to help Afghanistan without including the deeply conservative southern sort of Pashtun community that was represented by the Taliban. You can't help to mend a broken country unless you include all the different elements, all the different voices, all the different participants in that country. They must see that there is something in it for every region, every tribe, every part, every party. Uh, and I think we've got that wrong. And then, of course, 
The fifth thing we've tended to get wrong, and again, it's a mistake we've made over and over again, is one of the aims of development and helping fragile situations is we say we must, as soon as the conflict is over, we must transition to an early election. How many times have we heard that in the last 30 years? Again, our conclusion was that that was wrong. Not to say we don't want elections, I'm a profound believer in democracy. But if you set a timetable to an early election, you tend to get the participants in the conflict thinking they'll just wait for that election and try and win power through that election rather in the way that they failed to do so by force. So you get what I would call one person, one vote once rather than a more profound settlement. I think if you think about it, this makes intuitive sense. Much better to have a provisional government for a longer period of time that includes all the different elements of a country and start helping that provisional government to show a sense of success and progress and investment, to build the confidence, consent, and legitimacy of the people. And crucially, not to be measured simply in facts and figures and statistics, but actually to build a national story about what that country and what that government and what those people are trying to achieve. And I think to try and end on a hopeful note, if you look at situations where a country could have been very fragile, but has actually escaped that trap, you'll see that in almost every case there has been a compelling story about what that country and its leaders have told their people. Singapore could have been a profoundly fragile country, having broken away from the Federation of, of, of Malaysia, but has ended up being one of the most successful countries in the world. Why? Well, its leaders told a very effective story about being the least corrupt country in the world, about having the rule of law, about having open markets, about being a success story. Rwanda, well represented here, a massive success story, growing 10% every year, um, I think now for over a decade. Part of that, I would argue, is not just the facts and figures and statistics, but the story that Rwanda's leaders told the people and the world about what they were building after the genocide was over and bringing that country together and how they explained that. Look at the success of a country like Botswana with visionary leadership when it first became independent about bearing the heavy burden of progress and making sure that resources were shared more equally in that country than they have been in many others. I would also single out Bangladesh, some, somewhere I visited just before um, the pandemic. This is a country that has already achieved low middle income status and in the next couple of years is going to become a middle income country. Why? Again, I would argue they have told a story about the Bengali identity, they've massively invested in the garment industry, they've lifted people out of poverty, they've told a convincing story about what they're trying to do for their country and where they are taking it. And the conclusion of all this, and perhaps this is convenient for a politician to say, even an ex-politician, is that politics really does matter. The quality of political leadership, the way that politicians should be acting to bring people together and tell a convincing narrative about what they're doing for their country is absolutely crucial. And the argument I would always use to prove that beyond all um, peradventure is to invite you to stand on the 38th parallel between North Korea and South Korea. Don't actually stand there because you'd be on, standing on a landmine in, in the demilitarized zone. But the truth is, if you look at that, the choices those two countries have made, you can't put the success of one and the failure of the other. You can't put it down to ethnicity. You can't put it down to geography. You can't put it down to climate. They're the same part of the world, the same people. <laughs> You only can put it down to the choices those countries have made. The choice they made in South Korea to opt for a market economy, for democracy, for the rule of law, uh, for openness to the world, for investing in their country and their people, and the different choice made in North Korea. And indeed, you can look around the world. You can find pairs of countries with very, very similar uh, attributes and um, mineral wealth and situations, but very different outcomes. You could compare Zimbabwe and Botswana. You compare Venezuela and Colombia. You can compare, as I said, the two Koreas. In each case, similar countries, similar circumstances, radically different outcomes. Why? Because in one case, they understood the need to deal with those things that can make a country fragile. They dealt with the corruption. They dealt with the conflict. 
They dealt with the lack of consent between institutions and people, and they built success stories. And that, I think, is the note to end on, that while the condition of state fragility is holding so many countries back, while it has been such a difficult thing to try and solve, there are answers. I think the commission that I'm helping to run is helping to find them, and we're very keen to work with all of you to apply that in as many situations as we can. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Thanks. Uh, well, Prime Minister, I have stood on that uh, demilitarized zone in, in um, Korea, in, uh, and I was on holiday in North Korea, believe it or not, one of the few people to go there. Uh, but um, uh, we're now meant to have a fireside chat. Mm. I don't see a roaring fire in the grate, but uh, we probably need one. And there are lots of questions I'd like to ask you, but I'll stick to the script because um, uh, it would be unfair otherwise. Well, I mean, you've been passionate about this and you were passionate about things like climate change way before your time in a way, or other people's time. Uh, when did the light bulb sort of first go on in terms of fragile states? When did you suddenly realize this was... Uh, I think it was, I mean, it was a mixture of, of, of things. One was actually a trip I made in, as leader of the opposition to Darfur, um, and sort of seeing at, 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 at first hand um, the situation there. I think also the visit I made to Rwanda, uh, where famously I was addressing the Rwandan parliament. Um, there had been floods in my own constituency, and I was under pressure for why you in Rwanda rather than in West Oxfordshire. And while I was making my speech, the lights went out. And I remember it was one of those moments when you just think, this, is, this trip is really not going very well. But nonetheless, it was very influential in, in you know, thinking about um, the success stories of development rather than just the difficulties and the failures. Um, so that sort of definitely switched a light on for, for, for me. Um, and as I said, when I was Prime Minister, the more you did the job, the more you realized that countries like Somalia were taking up a massive amount of time um, globally because you had the terrorism problem with Al-Shabaab, you had the piracy problem with the shipping going around the Horn of Africa, you had the migration problem, you had the regional destabilization. So here was a, you know, a relatively small country but causing a huge amount of problems for itself and for the world and yet all the things we had traditionally done didn't seem to be helping and didn't seem to be working. So it just seemed to me that as you watch the Indias and Chinas lift their populations out of poverty, uh, you've got to do more to help the broken and fragile countries that really need um, much more tailored attention and support. And you mentioned DFID uh, and uh, you know, the shame about it being stopped, but a lot of people would argue that uh, they weren't discriminatory enough on where they allocated their resources. And maybe people might say, well, if you had uh, the Fragile States Initiative, which you are now championing, uh, whilst you were in government, it could have been a much more focused uh, approach. Uh, I mean, what would be your answer no, I think it's to a fair, that? I think, look, I would say this. First of all, we did quite a lot in government to try and focus the aid budget onto fragile states. I mean, for instance, we recapitalized what was the Commonwealth Development Corporation, yeah. CDC, and I think it's now an absolute role model for um, investing institutions. It is doing, you know, lots of equity and lots of help for small businesses. Um, and we did try and focus on the, the fragile states. I think the, where I, look, I understand where those that wanted to get rid of DFID, they, their argument was it's just a giant NGO, it doesn't really help pursue the government's priorities, and so why don't you bring it all together with the Foreign Office? Uh, I think that's a mistake because DFID was a global leader and a global actor um, uh, in terms of getting things done. And if you talk to any other countries in the world, you know, talk to the head of USAID, they would say that you know, DFID was always the first thing they'd ring up, right, we've got a problem in Somalia, what are you doing, what are we doing, how do we put this together? So I think that was important. I think you could get the, what the government wanted, which is the coordination between the Foreign Office and DFID, um, by working through the National Security Council, by bringing the two organizations closer together, you know, that's the way to do it. I think abolishing DFID altogether was a mistake. I think they've partly corrected it by having a dedicated development minister Andrew Mitchell, in, yeah. in cabinet, Andrew Mitchell, and that does make a difference. I think there was a period after the abolition of DFID where there are quite a lot of important global initiatives, whether on maternal health or vaccination programs or Gavi replenishment, really important things where 
understandably, foreign office ministers are very busy. And so, you know, who was leading for Britain on this issue where we are a leader? And I think the answer was no one was for a while, and that was a, that was a great shame. I remember um, making the suggestion to you that we should <laughs> put DFID and trade into the foreign office so that we could have aid for trade, but you were absolutely determined that wasn't going to be the case. Well, actually, uh, understandably so. I don't, I don't yeah, yeah. disagree I think, with I you. Think, I don't, you bring them close together, but you do need a dedicated minister when it comes to development. The way, I, the way I think about it is, is as Prime Minister, when you're sitting there in the National Security Council, you're looking at Somalia, you're looking at Afghanistan, you're looking at Yemen. As Prime Minister, you want to have as many you know, weapons in your armory, golf clubs in your golf bag as possible. You want to have the defense partnership you've got with the Afghan army. You want to have the foreign office working on the diplomacy. You want the home office working on drug interdiction. And you want the aid department dedicated to helping economic development in that country. And putting two departments together, I don't think helps to give you that, that range of power and influence you want to try and wield. And I think also, you know, if you are the foreign office and you're a minister for both uh, diplomacy and development, um, I think inevitably development is going to take a back seat because you're always going to be dragged to the next diplomatic crisis and, and the, the, the work on aid and development will take a back seat. So I think it was a mistake. They're sort of putting it right and I hope they keep looking at how much further they can go. Uh, and of course, in this current economic environment, um, more countries are going to become fragile. Um, and your voice needs to become, obviously, a lot louder as this happens. Uh, you alluded to some of the things that countries themselves can do to uh, rectify this position. You, you mentioned, obviously, the issue of corruption, which presumably means the enforcement of rule of law. Um, uh, I've, I've felt, and I've been interested in, well, we'd all be interested in your view on the fact that trade leads um, countries out of poverty trade and investment, and this is what this conference is about. So, I mean, if you were to give a sort of, for a, a single country that is falling in to, back into uh, this economic uh, fragility, what would be the sort of four or five strap lines in, in addition to the ones that you've mentioned? Well, I think, I mean, one of the things is to think what, what we can do to help those countries that want to help themselves. And if you take the issue, for instance, of corruption, I mean, of course, there's lots of expertise that you can share in a country that is relatively uncorrupt, that has the rule of law and all the rest of it. But crucially, you can help countries by making sure that when they're pursuing corruption in their own country, a lot of the money has been hidden in London or in Paris or Geneva. You've got to help them recover that money. So there's a whole bunch of things that we should do to help countries that are fighting corruption and do it um, much more, more quickly. So that would be a good example. Second thing, obviously, if you're advising or helping a country that wants to get the trade and the growth, I mean, ultimately, if you sort of stand back from it, or what is it that helps countries go from fragility to stability? It's a combination of knowing you are safe in your own home. It's a combination of that. It's a combination of, of being able to get a job, you know, not just for a state organization, but in the private sector to raise money to build your living standards. So it is sort of security and prosperity. Now, we can help with both of those things, as I said, by making sure the countries set their priorities and backing them as they do. That was the great Rwanda success story. Um, but also help them with the expertise about what are the basic building blocks of rule of law uh, that businesses require in order to set up, employ people, and expand. And I think sometimes in development, we can get overcomplicated about the millions of things we're trying to do, rather than just thinking, you know, lots of these countries, there is simply a shortage of firms. Why is there a shortage of firms? Because there isn't rule of law, there's no property register, there's no proper banking system. All the individual elements you need to build a growing economy aren't there, and, and uh, donor countries can help with those things. Well, one of the things we just before you were on was um, two of our key themes are food security and energy security, which have come into obviously very clear focus. Yeah. Um, what's your commission sort of advocating on, on that at the moment? Or are on, you on, on energy security? So we've, we 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 did a particular seminar and produced a lot of papers and work on this energy question because, as I alluded to in my speech, I think in the past a lot of efforts at helping countries with 
energy have been about big projects, big power stations, big national grids. Now, in many cases, that is appropriate. But in a post-conflict, very fragile state, the new grid um, can be subject to <coughs> terrorism and conflict. The new power station can become uh, an element of, of, of conflict between different different parties and, and indeed a source of corruption. You now have the ability to have decentralized energy, to have a combination of you know, solar panels, batteries, off-grid solutions on a smaller scale, but they can bring the light and heat uh, that are needed still in millions, hundreds of millions of homes across our world. So finding ways to help countries that want to have that investment in terms of decentralized energy. And there's the great success stories to learn from. I mean, Kenya has done a fantastic job with mm. decentralized energy and green solutions. And so you take the learnings from there and apply them um, elsewhere. So I think on the energy issue, it's, it's that. The other one was... Well, and just also sort of ticking another box of yours is the sustainability issue. Yeah. You might want to just mention... Well, yes, I, I, I'm going to say something um, controversial on this. Oh, my God. Um, which is, look, I, I'm all for uh, countries adopting green energy. We have a great record here. As Prime Minister, we, we you know, cut the carbon emissions at the fastest rate um, in our history. We, were, we said we'd be the greenest government ever, and on the figures show that we were, and, you know, we stopped a lot of coal generation. By the time I left office, we'd almost taken coal out of the um, generation mix altogether. So I, I yield to no one in my enthusiasm for taking action to get carbon emissions down and playing your part. But I do think there's something deeply hypocritical at the moment about Western countries saying to you know, small, poor African countries or fragile states on other parts of the world, you know, we'll not invest in any attempt that you have to make the most of your hydrocarbons. Um, I think this is just hypocritical because what's, what's happening is, is actually because the West doesn't want to use coal, it's buying up lots of gas and therefore, you know, it, we're sort of speaking out of both sides of our mouth. On the one hand, we're saying, no, no, you can't have any new hydrocarbon industries. But on the other hand, has anyone got any gas because we'd really like to buy it? I, I think there's nothing wrong with a, a, a poor country that wants to develop if it's got hydrocarbons, it, it, is, it should be developing those hydrocarbons for the good of its own economy and for the prosperity of its people. Of course, there's going to have to be a transition away from hydrocarbons over time. But I, 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 and I would apply the same argument to us. Why are we importing you know, gas from the other side of the world where we should be taking the last bits out of the North Sea? Yeah. So I think there is a bit of hypocrisy going on. And we're, the Fragile State Commission is going to look at this issue this year and try and uh, address it. Because I think otherwise, um, you're going to get a sense in some African countries that the West is being hypocritical. And you're going to get a lot of lecturing from the West about how you shouldn't invest in, in hydrocarbons. And I think countries should be given the option of how to develop these things sensibly for their own good as we all transition away from a hydrocarbon world. You tasked me when you were in government with reducing um, carbon footprint by 10% in each government department in the first year you were in, which was a, a wonderful uh, task. I bet it wasn't that hard, actually, because, I mean, there's probably well, it, a lot it, of wastage. There, there was a lot of wastage, and, you know, it was an easy job for me, of course, persuading people to reduce it. And we got to the final day of the year and found that we had to, we were a little bit short. And the people who were abusing it most was number 10, so you'll probably <laughs> find that, uh, you probably don't remember, it was a very cold day <laughs> on the 1st of January in number 10, because we had all the heaters turned off and removed one boiler. Right, and that's how we got our 10%, but uh, it was a great ambition of yours, and we carried on to do it. Um, the other uh, t topic was um, agriculture and yeah. food security, which yes. is now a, well, it's a huge problem. I mean, I was just looking at the figures actually this morning. If you I'm taking a country like Egypt, there's a big 102 million people. Uh, they import almost all of the grain, and uh, more than half of it comes from the Ukraine. So you're going to have, you know, this is going to affect a huge number of countries that are very import reliant. And I think what, what it points to is that we're living in a new world now, in this age of sort of disruption, I call it. And I think every country's got to ask afresh questions about security, energy security, food security, physical security. 
Uh, and again, I think the aid and development community, which I'm proud to be part of, hasn't always got this right. I think in some cases, you know, countries have been held up as poster childs for development because they're doing so many things that ticks a lot of boxes by NGOs. But, you know, not included in that is actually physical security. It's no good having the best aid and development program in the world if actually your country is not physically secure and increasingly we're going to have to give more attention to, to um, food security and energy security. So that needs to be a big part of development going forward. And uh, presumably your uh, committee, your group is, is working on, uh, on that? Or? Yes, so we're, we, we, are, we have to sort of prioritise our, our efforts. So, um, so far we've looked at co best with the conflict resolution uh, we've looked at this very important issue of tax because one of the things almost all fragile states share is a very low uh, ability to raise taxes to pay for anything. So the tax to GDP ratio in some very fragile countries is less than 10%. Now, I know we're rightly concerned about the tax burden in this country getting too high, but actually in many Are countries... Are we a fragile state? They don't, well, they're, <laughs> we're somewhere... <laughs> you very rarely find a fragile state with our tax burden. It's the problem is in the other end of the scale is countries who literally cannot raise enough tax to pay for the basic services that help to build the sense of legitimacy and consent. Because, of course, in a very fragile state, if the government's not doing anything for you, why should you start feeling faith in the government? So you get weak institutions and weak consent. That's the sort of definition of fragility. And I think the tax issue is very important and not given enough attention because countries should be able, even poor countries, to have effective ways of raising an amount of tax that they can start de demonstrating through public service delivery that the government is worth supporting. Um, so we've done that, we've done the energy issue that I've been um, talking about, and we're looking at our program for next year, but it's certainly going to include this issue of what should fragile states do with hydrocarbons. Um, because it's, it's a controversial one, but I think, and I saw some people nodding in the audience when I said it, I think actually it's something that um, a, a commission like ours, which has both, you know, ex leaders of a Western country, but also in Donald Kabaruka and in Ellen Sirleaf Johnson, um, African leaders with real credibility um, to, to opine and, and talk about this issue. Mm. Well, David, thank you so much for sparing the time. Pleasure. It's quite clear to us all in this room the passion that you have for this particular subject. And I, I think most people would take away the, the confidence that you're driving this yourself. Uh, as you have done uh, a, a number of things in your life with real commitment and inevitably there will be success. Uh, and um, it's very important for us, the Commonwealth countries, there are 31 countries represented here to hear your views on this, some of which are emerging, some of which have emerged, like you mentioned Rwanda, who are currently chair in office of the Commonwealth. And um, uh, we hope we can call upon you in the future to give of your best. So thank you so much you. on behalf of us all. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great discussion, important discussion. And we are going to go right into the next important topic, which is energy security, which was, of course, referenced just now. Also, quick piece of housekeeping. The roundtable on opportunities in Gabon, investing in sustainable development and carbon finance is starting upstairs in the old ballroom. What I'm going to do now is uh, hand you over to the chair for our next session, looking at energy security, Nero Cook, who is the group, group director of Capital Maharaja. Nero? No particular order. Get the colour in the middle. Even though I'm not wearing a suit, I'm a bit... Oh, do you want to sit on the end, then? No. Put them on the table. I mean, I don't... There you go, I've got mine up. It's just going to the bathroom. I'll be back. Yeah, sure, mine. Okay, so let me... No gender in this anymore. 
sure. I think we'll let them let them have a have a, a break and, and come back. These chairs, you always make your stomach a little big. <laughs> I do what they do, they make you look like them. So, um
My name is Nero Cook. I'm on the group board of the Capital Maharaja Organization in Sri Lanka, a privately owned diversified conglomerate. For the group, I oversee energy, infrastructure, government-related business, and facilitate foreign direct investment into Sri Lanka. In, a, in addition to this, I'm very fortunate to be on the board of CWEIC. And today, it is an honor and an enormous privilege to have this opportunity to moderate the panel discussion on energy security, ensuring that it's affordable, accessible, and sustainable. In my role in Sri Lanka, I often engage, sometimes like in a scrum, but more akin to a wrestler, with the policymakers and state-owned utilities to help encourage better and more sustainable policy. And what I've found over the years of this engagement is that when you place energy security at the absolute focal point of your policy, you'll find that sustainable solutions are prioritized and fossil fuels only play a supportive role, particularly if they're indigenous. This is a subject that's very close to my heart because Sri Lanka wants an energy secure nation with 100% renewable energy through complex hydro uh, solutions, in fact, largely funded by the British government and built by British contractors, finds itself today with less than 40% renewable energy penetration, of which only 2% is solar, and in a situation of acute energy insecurity. In fact, energy poverty. This is not only a phenomenon for developing nations. We're seeing developed nations at risk too. Geopolitics, supply side challenges, and an insatiable demand play an enormous role. And energy is the most basic raw material on, all of, you know, on which all of our industries run. We can be more efficient, but we'll always, need to be, it will, we'll always need it in one form or another. It can never be created or destroyed. With that being said, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our eminent, em, eminent panelists, Mansoor Amayun, co-founder and CEO of Bbox, Greg Jackson, founder and CEO of Octopus Energy, Laura Sandys, CEO of Challenging Ideas, and Philip Hildebrand, Vice President of BlackRock. May I start with the first question? And it, can I address you, Laura, to start? How can we make sure that the competing goals of energy security, minimizing climate impact, and energy affordability are not in competition? Well, I mean, I would look at certainly the decarbonisation agenda as absolutely not being in competition with affordability. I mean, we've got a massive drop in the cost of renewables. Renewables also deliver you other things that we have become a lot more sensitive to in the last year, and that is includes um, energy security, energy resilience. Um, I actually believe that when you start to look, and I would urge um, people here today who are looking at designing an energy system for their future, is that they don't try and squeeze a renewable system into a fossil fuel paradigm. Because I think what we've got is a very, very different system emerging. Um, renewables will require much more capital assets. The commodity will be of less value, but the capital that needs to be deployed, it needs to be decentralized and with very much designed, and I know that Mansour and Greg are very much in this space, designed around demand, around customers, rather than the system. And it needs to be digitalized because every time you create smart system design, you reduce overall costs. So I think we've got a very exciting future of cheaper energy. The problem we have, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, is that we're going through a transition where we've got, in some ways, two systems and we've got two price points and two sort of models which are coming together. So when we move totally decarbonized, I think we're in a very different place. And Greg, would you agree with uh, Laura's statements in, in that effect? Yeah, look, I mean, I think uh, we can be very optimistic about the future of energy, despite the fact that currently we're suffering from the worst energy crisis in my 51 year life. We can be optimistic about the future because the investments that societies have made in renewables have driven the cost mm. down to the point that 
uh, power from renewables, even before the crisis, was cheaper than from fossil fuels. Uh, and at the same time as we're changing the way we generate energy, we're changing the way we consume it. Uh, electric mobility uh, fundamentally changes our relationship with, with electricity because, you know, an electric car takes 7,000 watts, uh, an electric light bulb takes 2 watts. So in advanced economies, it's a total change for how we use our energy system. And in emerging economies, the opportunity for micro-mobility paired with cheap solar and cheap wind changes not only the ability to, for a home to light and refrigerate and enjoy life, but it fundamentally changes the way that cities and towns and villages will work. The technology is the same everywhere. I think, picking up on Laura's point, it's not a like-for-like -like transition. In the same way that mobiles enabled countries around the world to skip expensive landlines and move straight to a better infrastructure so we can do the same with renewables. So I think the wrestle in, in many rich economies between the old system as it kind of goes down and the new system as it comes up is going to be hard, mm. but the opportunity to deploy the new solutions directly to the billions of people around the world that don't currently have access to power is huge. And Manta, you'll talk about your thing in a minute. Interestingly, the comparisons are huge. Mm -hmm. Here in the UK, we've just started working with home builders to create homes that will never have an energy bill. Mm -hmm. They have solar panels, an electric heat pump. Uh, they have uh, a smart hot water heater uh, and a battery. It's all optimized. Mm -hmm. And the home will generate more electricity than it uses. And across the year, we guarantee that they'll never pay a bill. Uh, this is how we end up with secure, resilient, cheap and carbon-free future. Greg, if I may just follow up on that. Uh, the, the question is how can governments effectively aid the private sector in scaling um, investment in renewable energy? And I suppose what, what I have to ask is do governments really have a role or should they leave alone and just regulate? It's a great question. Look, I, the, there is enormous appetite, as people in this room may know, for private sector investment in the renewable transition. But throughout the world, the barrier to deploying that investment is that there are no routes to market. Access to grids, appetite from grids to change, distribution networks, monopoly distribution networks, all mean that we cannot build the solar farms, the wind farms, the hydropower, and provide the incredibly cheap new forms of consumption for consumers. So what governments need to do is uh, stop guarding the old world of the monopoly grids and distribution networks and open it up. Open it up to competition, open it up to uh, contestability, and open it up to plurality. So if we want to build a wind farm near a town and the people of the town want to host a wind farm, we can give them cheap power and we're not constrained by a 10-year wait for a grid connection. That's what we need across the world. Thank you. Um, Philip, what fiscal policies do you think can support the multi-billion dollar gap between existing investment and the level needed to ensure energy security while still reducing emissions? Thank you, first of all, for having me. Uh, great question. Um, Laura mentioned that transition, right? This is the arguably the biggest kind of structural change of the global economy that we've ever seen in history, perhaps with the exception of introducing fossil fuels, uh, kind of in the, in the 18th century or late 19th century. But, um, you know, this is, this is a fundamental kind of change of how we operate as a global economy. And as, as you've both said, um, it's going to be long. And importantly, it needs to be fair and just, particularly with regard to the developing world. We heard a reference to it from the Prime Minister earlier today. It doesn't do us any good if we quickly decarbonize the developed world and leave the developing world behind. Uh, that will not get us to net zero. So, so the, the fair and just element of this is incredibly important and it's difficult. There's also no question in my mind we've done a lot of work on this, that an orderly transition would be at the macro level the best macroeconomic outcome. 
right? So disorderly transition, in other words, if we either move way too quickly uh, and we leave big parts of the world without energy, or we move way too slowly and we end up suffering from huge physical manifestation of risk, are both going to be much more costly in economic terms than an orderly transition. The issue, of course, is this is going to cost, as, as you said, uh, billions of dollars. Now, to answer your question, I don't see any way for this to be funded by fiscal policy. We simply do not have enough money in the, uh, in the treasuries, if you, if you like, across the world to fund this transition by way of public money. So in the end, uh, this is all about mobilizing private capital. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need to mobilize private capital, and I would say in particular, uh, we need to see capital moving from the rich part of the world to the developing world, because that's where you know, the biggest investment needs are in the, in the developing world. Now, how do we do that? That's very difficult, and it gets back to fiscal policy or public money. Public money, I think, has an important role to play. Policy has a very important role to play. This is not going to be sorted out by itself. So you need the policy framework that will then allow the private capital to be mobilized into the right uh, places, particularly into the developing world. I think, uh, you know, the many things that, that are needed to do this, we can come back to it, but I would say that the most important dimension to me uh, is to find ways to encourage more private capital to go into the developing world. And for that, I think we need, amongst many other things, a fundamental rethinking of the multilateral institutions, the multilateral development banks, and the World Bank in particular. Um, you know, the rich countries need to start to think of um, some equity in this, which also means you can lose some money. And you need to move away from this um, absolutely protected creditor status of the rich countries when they work through the multilateral development institutions. So we need to find mechanisms, basically, to reduce some risk by way of the smart use of public money in order to then uh, mobilize the private capital. You know, I, I believe this is going to be this transition is going, to be, is going to mean the largest reallocation of capital we've ever seen in, in human history. Uh, but it's not going to happen just by itself. Now, the good news is, as most recently, we're starting to see serious discussions in the Bretton Woods institutions in Washington, uh, led by Janet Yellen, to really rethink the way some of the MDBs could work, could deploy their capital, which of course ultimately is their shareholders' capital, in order to find ways to, to lead to a much more uh, aggressive mobilization of private capital in support of the, the transition investments that will be required, particularly in the developing world. So this is really a very similar to what David Cameron talked about earlier. Uh, you know, what we cannot allow to happen, or we'll never get to net zero, is a sort of uh, entire regions of the world being left behind in this transition because they cannot attract uh, private capital. Uh, so this is really about finding ways to ensure that we see the capital being mobilized on a sufficient scale in order to make these investments to get us to net zero. Or is there anything that you'd like to add? To no, that? no, I mean, I, I, I think it's very interesting. I mean, one thing I would warn, um, sort of warn countries not to do is to adopt wholesale the sort of the UK energy model and the regulation that goes around it. It is, it was fine for the time, it is very, very old fashioned. I do agree with Philip that there needs to be frameworks into which you can make those investments. Um, but I would also urge the financial sector to understand that, and maybe this comes back to um, BBOX and what you're doing, and that is we need financial mechanisms that allow for, for smaller investments to be rolled out in multiple distributed ways. So I, I always say that governments and policymakers and also often financiers, they like, you know, my power station is bigger than your power station sort of world, right? And actually what we've got to get to is that everything is a power station, every home, every business. And that takes different financial models 
and it creates, and uh, the contracts for difference can be miniaturized. So you have a big contract for difference, but for multiple, multiple assets across different classes. I do think, you know, we've got the burden, as Greg says, of an old fashioned system. Do not repeat it. Shape a new, exciting system that will be more efficient, more productive, and cheaper. Mansoor, I think that transitions very well you into are. what you're... What <laughs> Absolutely. You're... I think one of the big problems that people don't speak enough about is the fact that around a billion people around the world have either no access to electricity or extremely unreliable access to electricity. Uh, roughly three billion people around the world have no access to clean cooking whatsoever, right? And it's extremely unfair. We live in 2022 where basically a third of mankind is living in extreme energy poverty. And, but therein also uh, is a big opportunity for change and about building a better future at the same time. One of the big things in Africa that has happened is it's, it has happened that it has leapfrogged so many times existing technology. So whether we look at telecom going from landline to mobile phones, as Greg mentioned, or the fact that payments could happen between two phones and, and leapfrogging the banking system. That exactly the same thing is happening in energy in Africa. And I really think what's happening in Africa is actually a blueprint for what's going to happen globally, which is the fact that each household can produce its own electricity. Each household can store its own electricity. Each household can at times share its excess electricity with its neighbor. So that, that aspect of smart meter smart control is actually something that's taking place today. In places like Rwanda, where we've been very, very fortunate to operate for the last six, seven years, in close collaboration with the World Bank, with close collaboration with the government, we've been able to actually reach 10% of all households in the country are actually on solar, on battery, paying their own electricity bill using mobile money. So when they pay, the system turns on. When they don't pay, the system turns off. And the really interesting thing is this. The daily cost of that electricity is cheaper than what people spend on kerosene, on candles, on diesel, et cetera. So even at the distributed level, yes. the, 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 the fact that it's not only the most obvious choice uh, from, a, from, a, from an experience perspective, it is actually the most economic choice. But let me tell you about some of the challenges as well, because uh, I, th I think that the technology exists, the, problem, the business models exist, et cetera. But in the developing world, and particularly around Africa, the, the perceived risk versus real risk, there's a big arbitrage. People don't understand how to risk assess investment opportunities. And especially when you go from a centralized model to a decentralized model, right, means that you have to trust the individual customer to make a payment versus the individual government to make a payment. That means a completely mindset change in terms of not just the business model, but the risk model that actually comes with that as well. And the f final thing I also want to say is that energy access and poverty are extremely linked. Let me give you an example of that. When we, when, you, when we see a household, let's say in Kenya, that did not have any electricity, I think we would all agree that it's a, it's a household that's poor. But if that household gets access to solar, has electricity, after a period of time can get access to clean cooking, it has access to, to, to a cheaper source of cooking method. One day might get access to water or smartphones or, or e-mobility as well one day. That household might not be rich, but it has definitely escaped poverty. So the fact that energy access is a pathway to all access is something I see daily in my business. And the fact that energy, to, by solving energy poverty, is the basis to solve poverty as a whole, I see that daily. And today we have over 4 million customers on that journey in 11 countries, but we could easily be 30 million customers, 40 million customers. The only thing that's constraining growth for companies like mine, uh, there are other companies as well, is access to capital. The access to capital remains a very, very, very challenging 
proposition. You have to literally justify customer by customer. He will pay me, I promise you. <laughs> and, that's the, and, and, and that's the way you have to aggregate up that portfolio to have access to capital. So if that perceived risk and real risk could be solved, access to capital could be made easier, and maybe some innovative solutions like carbon finance or carbon credits or other sort of credit enhancement mechanism uh, could be flown in, as someone mentioned. I think that would be something that we can see Africa not only being fully electrified, but the first continent that is a net absorber of carbon. Right, and that is that is the big. I think Mother Earth will will thank Africa more than than, than a household reducing its carbon. It has an opportunity to become a net absorber of carbon as a continent, and that's what I'm particularly excited about. And I think that still remains an untold story about what can happen. Thank you, Mansoor. I'm I'm going to ask Philip um, and then Greg if you wouldn't mind sharing your your thoughts on prosumers uh, as well immediately after. Mansoor raised that uh, access to capital is one of the biggest challenges, obviously, in developing markets and transitioning into, into renewables. Um, is there appetite uh, for financial institutions, private equity, given minimum ticket sizes and, and in investment thresholds in, in, um, in distributed grid uh, installations? Uh, as well as appetite for, for currency risk and credit worthiness of individual prosumers? Um, and how does one sort of you know, get around the, the barrier to raising capital for that kind of activity? Yeah, uh, I mean, there's definitely appetite. You know, if you look at every single discussion, every meeting you go to internationally now as, a, as part of the financial markets, is ultimately about the transition. The difficulty is, is kind of lead bringing the capital to this new system that you've described very nicely is, is a big challenge. Um, you know, we've also seen a wholesale change of the financial system. It used to be, when I started out in this industry, most of the capital came from the banks. Mm -hmm. right? So you had a very bank-focused uh, financial system that invested uh, into, into the world, not least into the emerging world. And then you've had a series of crises, new regulation, as a result of it. Today, we have a completely different uh, financial system, which is really capital markets driven. Banks find it very difficult now to lend into these types of projects, given all the regulation that have emerged after the multiple financial crisis we've seen in the last 20, 30 years. So what does that mean? When we say capital markets, what does that really mean? Well, it means it's savers. Uh, so I'll give you an example from our own statistics. We're the largest asset manager in the world. More than half of the assets that we manage are pension assets. So these are either current retirees or future retirees who've entrusted us through their pension plans, you know, managing that money. You can imagine that moving that money into a kind of highly decentralized, often quite risky, particularly when you're looking at the developing world, um, you know, that, that's a very difficult challenge. And that's where the system is blocked currently. Um, and I think that's the, the critical challenge in, um, you know, in, in funding all this. So when you say private equity funds, that sounds great, but private equity capital comes from pension funds, right, to a large extent. Sometimes it comes from, you know, high net worth individuals who may have a different risk appetite. But this fundamental kind of problem, how do we, we have, in a sense, a system that's evolved so rapidly uh, and then we have a financial system, and, and how, do we, how do you match these two things? I think that's the principal challenge in terms of funding this transition. And that's where I think, um, you know, some form of public policy, of the smart use of public money in order to incentivize, take out some of the risk, incentivize these investments back into uh, these types of new structures so that you can essentially you know, what this is really all about is you, you kind of reduce the risk or you elevate the returns so that by way of using public money in a smart way, you recreate a kind of OECD-like risk return profile so that you can then tap into these large pools of um, savings that largely come from, from retirees. Um, but at the moment, we have these two systems that are not matched up very well. Okay. Uh, and this is where, you know, 
I think the system is really struggling to get the capital flowing. So the appetite, yes, but how to connect the systems, as it were, is, is a real challenge, which is why what does well is small projects. You have you know, small venture firms that do certain things, or you have charitable capital that can do this on a small scale. But how we scale all this up, I think, is the, is the real challenge. Thank you. Uh, uh, Greg, I, you know, what role do you think companies like Octopus play in being the bridge between the prosumers, the installations, and attracting institutional capital, and de-risking um, individual small projects in, in that um, effort to, to have a decentralized grid. Yeah, I think you, end, <clears throat> you ended on a critical point there, which is heading towards a decentralized grid. Um, you know, the reality of our grids today is that they were built around the uh, physical characteristics of coal power stations, maybe a bit of nuclear and a bit of hydro. But basically, um, they were built around the idea that you can turn a power station on and off to meet whatever the off-taker, otherwise known as a consumer, demanded at any given time. Uh, in a world of renewables, many people worry that the intermittency of renewables is a problem because they're used to a world in which, as a grid operator or a generator, you're in control of your production far more than you are in a world of renewables. But in the old world, the generators, the grid operators, had no real understanding of the consumer. They kind of knew how much electricity was coming out of the system at any given time, but that was it. It was almost like having a, a road system, uh, and then fundamentally, as you're changing the way transport works, not understanding how commuters use the roads and how freight uses the roads. And I think the reality is we need to understand how consumers use power, what they're using it for, what they're using it for before and what they're going to use it for now. Because then we can ensure that they get the benefit of the fact that when it's windy, when it's sunny, we've got the cheapest power we've ever had and it will get cheaper every year. And the more we give them the benefits of that, to live the lives they want to live, to use the power the way that, that suits the characteristics of the new system, the way they change it will totally change. The way they use it will totally change. And, and, and that's why this importance of the smart grid, the smart meter, smart pricing, smart devices is so important. If you look at you know, uh, a rich economy, people will turn their dishwasher on at 5.30 or 6 in the evening because that's when they finish their dinner. But actually, if it made their power cheap or even free to run at 8 p.m., they'd be delighted. And certainly with things like electric cars, you know, the kind of thing we're supposed to do today is we've got tens of thousands of electric cars now where we optimize the charging on a per-household basis, uh, looking at real-time grids, weather, and other characteristics, other uses in the home and in their street. Every household has a different charging schedule. They don't care. They just plug their car in. We work it out in the background. We need to work, move to a world where you have that degree of smart behind you know, kind of the way in which consumers are pulling the energy. So they, they, if they don't want to think about it, they don't have to. But we're making the most of this entirely different physical system. Now, I think what's really fascinating about B-Box, for example, is you're building from the ground up. So instead of looking at a grid and saying, when are we going to pull the power? When's it available? How does it cost? You meet the needs of a household, and then you share the excess. If that essentially, you're building a decentralized grid by starting with what yeah. really matters, which is the consumer, and then heading towards the system. And I think we're going to meet in the middle. Mm. So in, in rich countries, we're increasingly saying, how do we change the way that people use our energy to make the most of the new forms of generation? But the grid is, the grid is going to get reinvented as we do it. And in countries where you're starting decentralized, they're going to build towards the same grid. So I think over the next 10 or 15 years, it'll happen. One quick comment on an orderly transition. There are so many versions of orderly and disorderly. Yeah. And I think we should note two things. The first is that um, many of the companies, institutions that today control our energy system don't understand this stuff. Uh, their current assets are not appropriate for this stuff. And I don't just mean the physical assets, the DNA of their people or their understanding of consumers. And on the other hand, a bit like we saw with the internet revolution, 
companies and institutions that didn't exist before are going to spring from nowhere to being colossally important. And I urge policymakers to be listening to the companies that are driving change, that are bringing solutions, as well as those that currently provide them. Because after all, you wouldn't have spoken to Kodak about the future of photography. Well, you would have done, <laughs> and you'd have invested in the wrong thing, yeah. right? And we risk holding back the battle against climate change. And more importantly, look, consumers around the world, in rich countries and poor ones, want cheap energy. We have access to the cheapest energy we've ever had. The only thing we've got to do is sort out the grids. I'll come back to that in a moment. Laura. No, I mean, just to sort of build on what Greg was saying, if you're an investor, would you be investing in IBM mainframes at this moment? No. You are investing in distributed assets, absolutely like Bbox is doing, and in many ways shaping your business model around demand. And I, I do quite a lot of, I was very interested in the first panel on food. I do a lot of work in the food sector. And picking up on Greg's point about intermittency, if you think about the food system, before we had refrigeration, we lost 60% of food, right? What is refrigeration and intermittent energy? Exactly the same. So you've got frozen food, which is long duration storage. You've got flash freezing, which is EV cars. The most important thing in the whole food system around elongating the commodity is the fridge in your home. Because if you didn't have a fridge in your home, your supermarket would have to be three times the size it is today. And that's why what you're doing, optimizing that demand in the home, is actually reducing the whole system costs. Mm. And that is what's so super exciting. If you start from my coal fired power station is bigger than yours proposition, <laughs> you will never optimize around that demand profile. And that demand will flex, and that demand will be shaped by, by price, by opportunity, and be in many ways in the driving seat. I'm sorry, I think it's pretty clear that the <laughs> panel have all we'll decided stay. that yeah. you are driving the way forward. Let me put a, <laughs> a controversial point though, while we're at it. <laughs> um, I think the energy transition will look quite different in different geographic and economic yeah. contexts. Let me give you my personal, the one that I emotionally battle the most with, is the aspect of clean cooking. So clean cooking, people don't have access to, uh, uh, to clean cooking across Africa and Asia and Latin America. Last year, probably four million women and children under the age of five died from inhalation of charcoal and, and firewood, et cetera, related diseases. It's a huge global crisis. When we look at it, unfortunately today with solar panels and batteries, it remains mostly uneconomical to cook on that because people cook during nighttime and, and batteries, cooking on batteries is just so far an, uneconomical. So what you end up is with, you need, to, you need to transition to something better. It's not perfect, it's better. So it turns out that one of the most effective solutions to clean cooking in Africa is LPG. Now that sounds quite controversial uh, coming from a European or Western lens, right? Like why should LPG or natural gas be a solution to any energy transition? But in fact, if you look at from the baseline, it, it's the journey, right? The journey is that they're using charcoal or firewood that which is prohibitively bad for health and environment. Then you transition to LPG that hopefully is better from a health perspective and definitely better from an environmental perspective. And maybe one day that leads to a pathway to a bio LPG or alternative fuels or even hydrogen or whatever the, 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 the next steps may look like. So I think what, one thing I'm noticing is some sort of prescriptiveness of what energy transition needs to look like because it makes sense where I am from and that needs to be applied on a global scale. I think that's really dangerous. Um, I think one needs to really look at it from a carbon calculation perspective and make sure that that transition journey makes sense in the local context. The end goal should be what, what, what we should be aiming for. The path may look quite different and that's something I'm getting a little bit concerned with some of the DFIs, et cetera, uh, that are getting quite uh, religious about what's, what's, what, what's uh, carbon mitigating or not. Mansoor, um, do you find it a challenge to, to attract institutional capital? Do you require institutional capital to be able to roll out um, and do you know, the projects that you're doing at a, at a household level? 
um, and how are you overcoming those two challenges? Look, on one side, we've been extremely successful in doing that in a space where we are. We have deployed over $400 million in capital in Africa, right? So from that perspective, we're one of the best capital mobilized companies that is doing energy transition in Africa. On the flip side, we need billions of dollars. To, uh, to be able to actually uh, to, to fulfill the demand that actually exists, the pro to solve the problem at the scale that it exists, etc. And yes, every 10, 20, 50, 100 million dollar is a challenge. And one of the things that happens in the global context, if I may sort of talk about the, the Ukraine or the, 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 the inflation or food crisis, etc., etc., is that one thing that people don't often forget is that you know, the path to, 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 to escaping energy poverty is a very fragile path. The IEA just issued a report for the first time in the last 20, 30 years, I might be slightly wrong on a time scale, the number of people without electricity has increased, not reduced, as a result of household expenditure. Right? So there's a reversal in trend. So there's a, there's a very large group of people that are borderline between darkness and light, quite literally. Right? And, and that group of people, if, if they go into darkness, it has a generational effect. If, if you bring them into light, it has a generational effect as well. So I think what we need to do, especially in this more fragile era that we are in right now, is that I think this is the time to actually double down on, on, on making sure that we actually build a more sustainable uh, bottom from which economic development can happen. And I think from that perspective, it's a very challenging time to, to, to communicate that because a lot of governments, a lot of investors are looking uh, at the existing portfolios, what's happening there, or more domestic issues, what's happening there. And, uh, and, 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 and I think you mentioned about the, uh, about the transition of capital that's needed from richer countries to poorer countries. That transition of capital has far greater hesitations uh, th than ever before. And, and, and I think that's, that, that's, that's something definitely we're seeing. Laura, do you think that we can achieve our targets, our global objectives, um, while still de delivering power to growing economies that they need to survive? Absolutely. I mean, firstly, for all our sakes and for all our future, we have to meet these targets. This isn't a nice to have. This is not optional. This is absolutely crucial. And, and I take a little bit of sort of counter view um, on Philip, and that is that actually the transition is not going to be managed. It's not going to be straightforward. It will be quite messy. And I think we've got to lean into that because actually the imperative is there. Um, when you start to look at new solutions and you start to look at um, access to energy, which Mansour is doing in an extraordinary way, when you start to look at um, how we can ensure a greater equality of clean energy, then I think it is feasible, but it needs to be a much, much more important part of, in many ways, the development agenda. I mean, when we talk about, you know, you talk about people's lives being either in the dark or in the light, I mean, what happens to children's education if they do not have light at home at night, right? How does this impact them, not just in that moment, but right the way through their lives, achievement? And I think we've got to start to understand that both energy and, to be frank, um, and certainly Africa is a big leader in this, communications are actually basic rights and basic needs to build any form of stable and prosperous economy. Thank you. Um... Philip, I'm going to come back to you for, for a moment. Um, same question, I suppose. Do you think that you know, the world will be able to achieve their targets of delivering power to growing economies? And what would be the investment strategy that one would advise in order you know, to be able to propagate that? Well, I, I think we have to first take stock, you know, are we on track? And I would argue the answer is decisively no, um, right? I mean, one of the big debates right now in finance is, is it still realistic to basically operate under the kind of Paris pathway to net zero 
And I think the brutal reality is we're far off track. You, know, you can look at you know, different numbers. We saw a lot of estimates coming out of the COP. But it seems pretty clear that, that we are significantly off track, or probably tracking closer to between two and three degrees than anywhere near the one and a half degrees. That means, of course, Laura, you know, you're likely to be right ultimately, this is gonna get very messy. And in a sense, messiness means sudden disruptions. Uh, and you know, we've, we've had a flavor of what messiness looks like during COVID. In a sense, <clears throat> to me, this is kind of a, a script that we can refer to when we think about really disorderly uh, transition, where suddenly you have things shut down, you have big disruptions right down to the social, political level. So there's an enormous amount at stake here, even in the short term, apart from the kind of longer term education yeah. that you mentioned and so forth. So uh, it, is, it is critical. We have to, as you said, we have to get there. At the moment, we're off track. The question is what's needed to kind of re-accelerate this effort. You know, the good news is some things are in place. We have uh, renewable energy has fallen dramatically in cost. And frankly, through these supply shocks, including the war, we've had carbon energy has gone way up. So the green premium problem, in a sense, has disappeared. And that, of course, should spur investments. Uh, again, it's how you get the money to where it's needed. And I think you probably need to think about scaling it down. So we've done a project, just to give you one example, a practical one, which was initiated by the French government, President Macron, um, to say we need to get money into Africa for renewable infrastructure spending. It can't be like, we can't think in billions, we have to start in millions. Public money was used to have what's called the first loss protection tranche put into it, catalytic capital, it was referred to. And then on the back of that, we were able to raise private money um, to a fund that ended up being um, very successfully, we raised more than $500 million in order to build renewable infrastructure locally in, in, in the emerging world, including a significant allocation in Africa. But you know, these are small projects in relative terms. These are not billions and billions of dollars. And again, how do you get big pension money into projects that are in the millions, not in the billions? But I think that's what we have to do. My guess is in line with the way you described the future of the, of the energy system, we have to kind of create um, investment funds, in a sense, vehicles that have some risk reduction in it through smart policy, through smart use of public money, and then bring capital to match that and, and you know, adjust the risk return profile so that it happens. My concern is how do we do that at scale, right? And I think that's, that's where the market is struggling. Uh, and, and the scales involved, if you look at the estimates that many smart people come up with now, we're talking trillions of dollars every year for years and years to come. You know, and how do we create these type? I know how to create the structure at a level of a couple hundred millions, but how do I create a structure like that at the level of billions, let alone trillions? I think that's the kind of uh, that's the historic challenge we face, and we're, you know, we're a long way from having solved that. In the end, I think the big question will be: you you raise this, you know, will this will the innovation come from the disruptors or from the incumbents? I see a lot of, maybe you see this more pessimistically, but I see a lot of focus of the big um, energy companies, you know, that have thousands and thousands of engineers to kind of reimagine a future world. And I think it's an open question. We're seeing this play out in finance right now. You know, we were convinced, many of us, that disruption would come from the disruptors, the incumbents would lose. When you look at what's happened in the crypto space in the last few weeks and months, Maybe that's not so clear anymore. So I think this question of who will actually bring the solutions, will it be the disruptors, bottom up, the kind of examples we're hearing here, or will it ultimately be, you know, will the carbon companies be a big part of it that kind of reinvent their own future in a sense by putting to work uh, the enormous resources they have? And remember, they're making enormous amount of profits right now. So in principle, they have a lot of capital to invest. And to me, this is one of the real 
big questions. Who will be the winners, the disruptors or the incumbents? I think it's an open question. Thank you very much. We're going to have to wrap up uh, very soon. Would any of the panelists like to make one last closing remark before I um, uh, thank everyone? I should pick up on the uh, incumbents versus disruptors. <laughs> I mean, first of all, it's true that thanks to the horrific war in Ukraine and prior to that, the global supply chain shortages that incumbents who own fossil fuel production are um, making phenomenal profits. I note that a lot of that is being spent on buybacks because they don't have the plans for the future. Um, I think the um, battle between incumbents and um, uh, challenges or innovators, it'll probably end up a bit like the, uh, what happened in airlines, which is low-cost, highly efficient airlines around the world. Some of them with outstanding customer service, others with different propositions, grew to true scale. Uh, incumbents uh, went through a period of uh, transformation, uh, consolidation, and uh, some bankruptcies and some mergers. And you ended up in a world where today, <clears throat> there are large airlines that start in, in both places. I think that's what we'll see among companies. But I think the challenge is what happened in airlines, if policymakers had spoken to the incumbents, they'd have backed a very, very different view of the future than if they watched what happened in the market, the battle between the challenges that had new models and the incumbents that were forced to learn from those models on things like operating efficiency, intelligent operations of capital, and actually delivering what consumers wanted. Uh, and, and I think you have to look very, very hard to find any incumbents at scale in any global industry who've actually driven change and who've anticipated correctly where change was going to go. So whatever you do, you need routes to market for the challenger ideas because they're going to be the pathfinders. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank, first of all, wonderful audience for being with us today and uh, the eminent panelists I'd like to thank Mansoor, um, Greg, Laura, and Philip for, for making for amazing discussion, fascinating discussion, hopefully to be continued in the next room. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much. That was fun. Thank you. And thank you very much, Nero. Important discussion, insightful discussion. Now, good news, it's lunch. So uh, go out, get some food, digest the morning's conversation, and we will, we will be back here at 1.45 for the next plenary, the Africa opportunity. Thank you.
Okay, welcome to the final stretch, everybody. I hope you've had a good lunch. Uh, plenty of networking going on. We are going to continue with uh, what promises to be a very engaging, very interesting session. Uh, quite simply, the Africa opportunity. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Mercy Muroki, who is going to be running proceedings. Mercy, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming to this session. Um, in this session, we're uh, going to use the opportunity to explore what opportunities and challenges are faced when it comes to investment in Africa, and uh, in particular, we're going to focus on infrastructure. Um, I'm going to be joined by three esteemed panellists, as well as Dr. James Mangi, who will be uh, giving opening remarks. Uh, the story of Africa's development is changing. Six of the world's fastest growing economies are in Africa. Governance is increasingly strengthening. Investment opportunities stretch far and wide. And the world is very keen to do business with Africa. But there does remain some challenges, and most notably a finance gap. Uh, for instance, the African Development Bank as to estimates that the continent still requires up to £108 billion in investment every year to build better infrastructure. McKinsey estimates that £93 billion is needed annually over the next decade just for sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, on top of uh, finance access, other limitations remain like power, uh, logistics, and political and institutional challenges. So in this session, we're going to discuss those opportunities and those challenges and look at what is needed both in the immediate term as well as uh, in the long term. Uh, now, Dr. James Mwangi is going to be given opening remarks. So I'll hand over to him in just a second. And afterwards, I'll introduce my panel. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm sure most of you do. He is the group CEO of Equity Group Holdings. Uh, he's led Equity to become an integrated financial services group operating in six African countries across Central and Eastern Africa, client base of over 17 million and asset base of over uh, 13 billion US dollars. Uh, he's credited with democratizing financial access across Central and East Africa, and he has a number of awards under his belt as well, which includes the 2012 Ernst & Young uh, World Entrepreneur of the Year Award, and has also been named by the Financial Times as top 20 most influential people in Africa, and one of the Bloomberg 50 in 2019. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. James Mwangi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, our moderator colleagues. It's uh, really great honor this afternoon to be a discussant uh, on the African opportunity. I've just been given seven minutes, so allow me to go straight uh, uh, to the conversation. When you talk about uh, the African opportunity, this is a, an opportunity scattered um, uh, among 54 countries. So it's always good to bear in mind that uh, when we talk about challenges, they are not challenges of Africa, they will be challenges of individual countries. When you talk about opportunities, there will be opportunities uh, of very specific uh, countries. However, uh, it is good to say generally, Africa is at the same level of economic development. So there are many similarities within the 54 countries because of uh, the state. Most of the African countries are 60 years old in terms of uh, uh, the sovereignty. So again, both in every aspect, whether it's uh, governance structures, whether it's legal frameworks, whether it's demographics, they are almost the same. So there are a few areas I will generalize, uh, but then you remember, it will be very, very specific. Uh, broadly, Africa is a massive continent. It is said you can feed America, you can feed India, you can feed China, and still be left with the space for Australia and New Zealand. That is the size of uh, Africa. So again, so the biggest opportun uh, opportunity is a diuterized natural resources. 
because you talk of nearly 30% of the global admas, but only 1.2 billion people. So it's one of the most sparsely populated uh, uh, populi uh, continents we have in the Africa. However, because of its size, Africa is endowed a lot with natural resources. Maybe generally speaking, 40% of all the critical natural resources of the world are in Africa. 60% of all albo lard that is not utilized for food security, for agriculture, is in Africa. So that's a very specific example. When you look at the critical resources that will lead the world in um, clean, cleaner environment, let's put it that way, they are broadly in three countries in Africa. So that concentration, so let's see the biggest opportunity, is productivity gains in agriculture and natural resources. Africa lags behind the rest of the world in productivity gains. With um, modern science and technology, Africa can leapfrog and become very, very productive and most likely beat the rest of the world because it has no legacy systems. So it will, its investment straight away uh, to modern science and technology and then productivity in Africa can go six times. In agriculture and productivity in natural resources. If that is the case, then the next biggest opportunity other than productivity gains. And when I say productivity gains, it means revenue. Because lad, you don't need to increase the amount of lad, it is increase in productivity of lad. It's not increase in amount of ex extraction of natural resources, it's the utilization of natural resources. Now, if productivity goes up six times, the second opportunity then is value addition huge opportunity for value addition, particularly in the agricultural sector. That is supported by two major factors, a rapidly growing population in Africa that is anticipated to be at 2.5 billion by 2050, doubling in just under 30 years. So you could imagine how steep that consumption uh, will be. The second one is urbanization. As population become urbanized, it sh uh, shifts away from feeding on low f food. It has to be processed. That food needs to be transported from rural areas to urban centers to feed 70% of urbanized uh, population. The third one, of course, uh, is uh, that we really can talk about is demography. At 1.2 billion people, however, let me qualify, in 54 countries is a big market. So don't see it from an African continent. You can put it in perspective of trade blocks. The East African community, the ECOWAS, the COMESA, and see it that way because that's the level of integration. It is not, there is a spilation of the African continent, uh, continent of free trade area, but there is already existing regional trade block. So if you talk about East Africa, you are talking about 300 million people. You are talking of America, you are talking about Europe in terms of population. But the most uh, significant aspect of that population is it has a mineage of uh, 18 years, the entire continent. What it means is that if you capture the consumer, you might have the consumer for the next 80 years. So the cost of acquisition of a client over the period you are likely to maintain the grant is very, very low. So you can compare that with Japan or Italy. I don't know, want to be specific about uh, the average age of the population, but you will see a gap of nearly 40 years but in terms of the period which, which you could. So that is a huge opportunity in the African continent. Now, we talked about uh, a mean age of 18. Now, talk about technology. Which other market can then beat Africa in, cons in uh, the opportunity of technological investment? This is a digital age. 
they have gone to school during uh, the fourth industrial revolution. It's not even a digital age, it's the fourth industrial revolution. So it's savvy in terms of technology and hence consumption of technological investment or the opportunity to invest in Africa is very, very massive. The last one is uh, looking at uh, the global uh, environment. COVID was um, a health pandemic, but the consequences were not necessarily of a healthy nature. They ended up being more of an economic nature. The biggest impact of COVID was uh, uh, really the issue of uh, broken supply chains. It did break supply chains. And the question is, Africa could not get PPEs for almost two, three months until it developed its own capacity. And so Africa has realized when tough movements come and uh, global supply chains are not working, it will be cut off from supply like it was done with the vaccines. Africa has chosen to develop local and regional supply chains. And if it does regional su uh, supply chains, then the best uh, opportunity is in Africa because it is a sovereign decision by countries that we can no longer de depend on global supply chains. There is a war in Europe, but the countries that have suffered most are the ones in Africa because of the great dependence they had on Ukraine and Russian wheat and sunflower. And suddenly they have realized we have 60% of the RAD. Why don't we use the RAD and um, liberate ourselves from dependence? I think that will spread uh, to edible oils. In 1960, DLC in Nigeria were number one and number two largest producers uh, of uh, edible oils or the low material. Today, 90% in, is in Southeast Asia. Nothing has really changed. Africa can bounce back. The concentration of manufacturing. We saw what happened between Russia and, uh, and uh, Ukraine, or let's call you the European situation. What, if, what about if there was an Asian situation? What would happen to Africa with its dependence on manufactured goods, all concentrated from uh, Asia? Africa has woken up to the reality that it has to develop an element of self-sufficiency. And Africa has realized it doesn't have resources. So let me close by saying the biggest opportunity for Africa is trade and investment. Trade with Africa because it has a young growing population likely to be 25% of the entire world population by 2050. You can't go long with a mean age of 18. So huge opportunity. If we are in technology, the biggest market in the world will be Africa because of the mean age of the population. So trade, trade, trade. But ultimately, Africa has decided it needs to create its own local and regional supply chains, and that means investment. The investments in Africa spread across, and I think uh, our moderator, Masi, talked, uh, or the introducer of the program, talked about infrastructure. Look at the case of Kenya. Kenya now 83% of all energy is uh, renewable green energy. But if you go to the arithmetics, about 60% of it is generated by the private sector. It's public-private partnership. So infrastructure, utilities are very big. Those who have uh, recently been in Nairobi, there is an expressway uh, from uh, the airport all the way to Westland. It's a private investment, literally almost everything. We are now talking about if you can do this in loads, if you can do it in power, why can't you do it in water? And so essentially a huge opportunity in infrastructure. The second uh, biggest uh, opportunity other than infrastructure is manufacturing. Urbanizing population, 
require a lot of food, processed food. Lard is there, productivity is going up, that food needs to be processed for the urban uh, population. Huge, huge opportunity. And of course, productivity gains on natural resources. To me, the biggest windfall in Africa is on productivity gains. Because every other part of the world has managed, whether it's through the agrarian revolution, the green revolution, they have increased their productivity six times higher than where Africa is. So we need to use the same, and now we have modern technology. Why don't we use that technology? And uh, of course, benefit from the weed for. And that in natural resources, 40% of the critical natural resources of, Africa, of the world are in Africa, value addition. I think the issue that really remains is the firmness of the African government to say, process our resources in Africa and trade in Africa, and then export to the rest of the world. So to me, that's how I see it. And the last, as I see it, I would say I've watched the equity, as you know, we sustained a growth of 116 pass compounded growth rate for 21 years because you are starting from a very low base, very, very low base. So you can grow exponentially. And when you grow, those who know the story of equity, in the last 20 years, we have issued 600 bonus and split shares for every share anybody has had in 2000. 600 shares on one share in 20 years, simply because of growth. That is the African opportunity. I wish you well as you take your flight, as you take your checkbook to write your investment in Africa. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. James Mangian. From a personal note, it's really nice to hear another fellow Kenyan because there's not many Kenyans in British politics. Um, so it's nice to hear a, a familiar uh, voice and a familiar accent as well. Thank you for your thoughts. I'm just going to introduce um, my panel today. Uh, we have Julia Prescott over on your far left over there, co-founder and chief uh, strategy officer at Meridium, a global infrastructure fund with over 18 billion pounds of assets under management and over 100 global projects. Uh, Julia is also a commissioner on the UK's National Infrastructure Commission, uh, a member of the government's UK Investment Council and an honorary professor um, at the Bartlett School at the University College London. Uh, in the middle, we have Toyin Sani, who's executive vice chair of Emerging Africa Group, a pan-African investment group which invests in sectors such as roads and, um, and power infrastructure, investment banking and fintech with a focus on SMEs. Uh, in 2016, Toyin also founded Women in Finance Nigeria and then went on to, to fund this, uh, an equivalent group here in the UK. Uh, she's the recipient of multiple awards, including uh, the Forbes Africa sponsored All Africa Business Woman of the Year 2017 and Nigerian CEO of the Year 2018 by Pearl Awards. And to my right here, we have Antanas Bostandiev, uh, founder and chairman of Gemcorp, launched uh, in 2014. It's a London-based fund dedicated to investing in emerging markets and is predominantly active in Africa. Uh, since its inception, it's been investing across sovereign and corporate emerging markets and African opportunities, alongside investments in credit and equity transactions in excess of six billion. And he's also spent the last 25 years working in financial services uh, for banks globally, again, with a focus on emerging markets. Uh, now, I want to start with you, uh, Julia. Meridium has four of its 11 offices globally uh, in Africa, so you very much get to see um, Africa in a global context as well. And I just wondered through um, your uh, business uh, activities, what are the opportunities that you see that are specific to Africa? Thank you very much indeed, Mersin. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll just do a... a a moment or two on, on Meridium and, and what we look for. I mean, Meridium, as explained, is an international infrastructure investor fund manager. 
But we have a particular approach which very much focuses from the whole cradle-to-grave life cycle, as it were, of projects, which means we're a developer, we're an investor, we're an asset manager. And we've been talking about the Africa opportunity. And as well as investing across Europe and North America, and doing so since 2006, in 2016, we set up a num uh, Africa, initial Africa fund, followed subsequently by another, uh, equating to over a billion dollars worth of equity capital for infrastructure in Africa, or as Dr. Morangi said, separate countries in Africa. Um, we, must, uh, we must look at that division. And now we have invested across um, 14 uh, countries. Uh, we have a whole series of different investments across transport, um, road, rail, airports, as I say, a lot of these have been greenfield, because energy from solar to, um, to biomass to, to geothermal. And when we look at Africa and we look at the African opportunity, we think that there is a massive um, amount that we can do. But there are certain challenges, which I think it's worth, it's worth pointing out. So what we see of Africa in the context of our total portfolio is uh, it takes up approximately 20% of our total portfolio. We think it could be greater, but the number of challenges we face, for example, in relation to what is called the investable project, um, a number of projects need um, support in relation to their preparation. I think McKinsey has said nearly 80% of projects that actually start as concepts and ideas in Africa tend to, uh, as it were, just fade away before they can get any further. So we are very supportive of working with countries, with organizations, and also most recently with cities to see what we can do to develop that investability of projects. And then once those are better to be put in place, we think that the capital will then come. Um, just very quickly on cities, we did set up this Urban Resilience Fund, uh, co-created with the Rockefeller Foundation, to focus on putting catalytic capital into cities to help with this investability. Now, there are lots of other challenges. I don't want to take up too much time, but I just did want to express our enthusiasm um, as a, an international investor to invest right across the series of sectors in Africa. Mm. Thank you. And to you, Choi, um, now your group was established to uh, bridge Africa's access to finance gap, and you've helped raise over one billion US dollars for governments and companies. And you do focus on small and medium uh, sized enterprises. And you, you think we shouldn't focus too much on these large infrastructure projects, but we shouldn't forget the small guys um, as well. What's been your experience of that? Thank you, Mercy. So when we set out, um, we started business um, just under five years ago, and we started you know, as an investment banking business. And typical investment banking business, our biggest opportunities, of course, were with the big tickets, because essentially it's the same process, it's the same work, but um, the returns are different. But then um, increasingly we realized that if we were going to have um, impact and have satisfaction and be able to respond positively to, let's say, you know, maybe three or four out of um, six or seven um, potential clients that walk through our doors, we would have to look away or we would have to look beyond your typical investment banking clients. And so we started working with um, small and medium scale enterprises as well. We set up an SME desk and right now we're incubating um, uh, a couple of funds that are targeted at one at tech SMEs and the second one at um, women owned um, businesses across Africa. But our experience has been exciting because we have found that these businesses have grown with our support and they have grown to the point where we were now able to um, raise bonds for them. And so up till now, we have raised funds significantly for um, tech companies. We have raised funds for power companies. We have raised funds for um, some of the municipalities, the state government specifically for power road um, infrastructure. And we've raised funds, okay, for, uh, we've raised a couple of green bonds. So the, it's been very rewarding. Um, we've realized that some of the projects at first appear very hard to make them to be bankable and to attract investment. So sometimes we've had to put the initial investments in ourselves 
as we you know, take them through the proof of concept. And then we have found that later we were then able to bring in other investors. So um, in terms of what has happened with our business, and maybe to just um, talk about, um, to speak to the point that Dr. Mwangi made, um, we found that our own investors have been able to enjoy 8.5x returns or in less than five years. So it shows you that um, doing good in Africa is also a way to do well. Mm. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Atanas, let's move on to you. You've written about uh, the risk, the perception of risk when it comes to investing in Africa, and you've said actually it's often um, overblown. Just can you talk to, to us about why you think there is such a compelling case um, to invest in Africa and, and seize those opportunities? Thank you, Marcy. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being on this panel as well. Just a couple of words maybe about uh, uh, my firm, GemCorp. Um, since inception in 2014, we've invested uh, more than uh, $5 billion in private uh, deals, direct lending, private credit in Africa, uh, which probably makes us one of the UK's largest uh, private uh, credit investor. And uh, we feel the challenges uh, and the opportunities every day. Uh, we live and die with those. And I'm really passionate, uh, as uh, my colleagues and partners said here, about investing in Africa, because I personally grew up uh, in communism. I was fortunate enough uh, to study in the States and uh, to spend 20 years here of my life in uh, UK financial industry. And I know what it takes to be given the opportunity, and we're passionate about now giving the opportunity to this incredible uh, population, incredible young talent that Africa has, uh, because that's not really the future, it's actually the present. That's, that's what, uh, 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 what it is about. Many people speak that Africa is the future, but it's happening now, and we're passionate about giving the opportunity to those young people. Now, to your question about um, the, the, the challenges and the perception of misperception of risk investing in, in, in Africa. Um, we, we feel it and experience it because the biggest challenge, we all agree that the opportunity is investment in infrastructure, in industrialization, but all this requires capital, right? And the current allocation of global risk capital to Africa is de, minim de minimis. When you look at global institutional uh, investors, including the pension funds, the insurance companies, the institutional investors from the Commonwealth countries, if you look at their allocation of risk capital to develop markets vis-a-vis -vis emerging markets, the proportions are, uh, are, just, are just disproportionate, right? It's so small allocated to emerging markets. And when you take the Africa quota out of that, uh, it's even, even uh, much smaller. So how is this continent, how are these 54 countries going to benefit? How are they going to attract capital, institutional capital, when the institutional capital that should be coming there is just not looking for it? Because a lot of the uh, people, a lot of the investors misperceive the actual risk vis-a-vis uh, the perceived risk. And I'll give you a very simple uh, example, uh, uh, simple, simple numbers. Take a look at the IMF quota that IMF attributed to Argentina. Argentina is 44 million people. It has defaulted more than seven, eight times over the last 20 years. And the IMF has contributed or given a quota of $44 billion for 40 million people. Now take a guess how much the IMF has attributed to Africa. Anybody? $30 billion for 1.4 billion people. Look at the World Bank's, World Bank statistics. Also, World Bank has allocated much more capital to Latin America significantly more in Latin America than in Africa. So unless global policymakers, Commonwealth 
investors, institutions, governments take a systematic approach in changing the policy that, yes, actually, let's not only talk about it, but let's put our money where our mouth is, that is the first way to change the risk perception. Mm. It needs to be backed by policies. Uh, thank you. Judah, I want to come to you. How do we, who needs to be in the room and who needs to hear these compelling arguments in that case for Africa uh, and African countries to get this investment, which it clearly so desperately needs, and of course everybody here thinks there is a compelling case to be made, but why is it not getting across to the right people? Well, can, can I talk a little bit about the risk perception to start off with and, and, and go from there? Um, I mean, we have in our funds investing in Africa, we do have pension funds, we have insurance companies. Um, we also have DFIs, but the, actually in our latest funds, the largest proportion are international investors of one kind or another. And one of the ways in which we, we look at, as it were, softening that risk perception is making sure that a number of the projects that we invest in are blended, and they're blended finance in between the public and the private sector. And I think the whole move towards blended finance is a very key part of implementing projects. The other key part is um, to look at uh, the potential for either external guarantees. I'll give you a particular point. When we're looking at um, power projects with PPAs, it's often the case that there's a higher risk perception in relation to the utilities with whom the PPAs are contracting. Now, in certain countries, what we've seen is support, for example, from World Bank partial guarantees, which have actually softened the level of risk perception. It means you can get international investors in. Alternatively, look at political risk insurance. Now, I think that, that the, in answer to your question, I think everybody needs to be in the room. And we need to work out a relationship between the public and the private sector that people feel comfortable with. For too long, the public sector and the private sector sat on different sides of the table. And there was a nervousness as to how they were going to conflate in, with one another. I think we now need to bring everybody around the table to make sure that we can actually focus on projects that can be done and projects can be done with a good risk perception. And once you start seeing projects done, once you start seeing paid for, you can get people to come in. Mm. Uh, Antoine, do you relate to, to what uh, the other panellists are, are saying, especially when you're looking at it from um, an SME perspective? Okay, so I relate completely with um, what um, my others, the other panellists have said. And before I touch on the SMEs, I would also talk a little bit about government projects. And um, what we have done when we have partnered with government is to put in a structure that ensures that we can then have private sector transparency and controls into the utilization of the funds that are raised, thus building confidence in investors. And we've done this successfully, and it has enabled us to raise increasing amounts from the debt um, capital market and for longer tenors for the state governments we have worked with because these funds were put in a trust account and these funds were released only in line with agreed milestones and then we had independent project monitoring that was under the trustees to the project and so it gave confidence because there was this perception that if you give money to um, a government agency um, you would come back three, four years down the line and find that there is no project in place. But now we ring fenced this funding and we put in structures and we've been able to successfully raise increasing amounts for the states that we've partnered with. So there is um, an opportunity for uh, collaboration between the public and the private sector, the domestic, you know, private sector and um, public sector to then put structures in place that encourage internationals to come in. So um, with one of our clients, they're now at the point of sealing um, a much larger funding from an international development finance institution on the back of the preliminary work that we were able to do to actually get these initial stretches of road built. So um, from the um, SME perspective, what we expect will be able to attract international funding will be from the venture capital and PE funds, the local ones that are 
putting together um, or, or essentially um, attracting international funding, funds that are able to, you know, operate as fund of funds and then putting money in domestic funds so that more money can go mm -hmm. into um, the local projects. And, and, and that's what we're working on. Thank you. Uh, I just want to touch on something uh, Dr. James Mangi mentioned um, in his opening remarks, which is uh, this fourth industrial revolution and the focus on digital and technological investment um, as well. Atanas, let's just go to you. Do you think there's uh, enough focus on that side of things? Because we all know that you know, digital is the future and there is so much untapped uh, potential uh, in Africa, especially with places like Nigeria where there's such a huge young, work, uh, young population, 70% I think are under 30. These are the sorts of uh, young people we should be investing in to um, make sure that fourth in industrial revolution in Africa is taken advantage of? Absolutely. I fully sus subscribe to uh, Dr. Wangi's uh, view on this. And actually, we within GEMCORP, we have a strategy to invest in um, uh, high-tech uh, companies across Africa. And uh, we have uh, backed up from the very early beginning one of the fastest growing fintech companies in, in Africa which brings financial inclusions to uh, tens of millions of people by using latest uh, technology. This is the future, and I think Africa is the place where you see digital leapfrogging, right? There, there you go to the, immediately to the latest technology, the latest uh, innovation, and it requires innovative financiers, investors like ourselves, like uh, people here in the room, to literally be out there, meet such entrepreneurs and empower them, give them that capital that is required. Because sometimes from our experience, we are not talking large sums of money. It is even with a few million of dollars of investment, you make a huge, huge impact. And um, uh, we are literally practicing this every day, uh, what, we, uh, what we are preaching. In terms of the industrialization, absolutely. Um, uh, that is the future. Uh, without industrialization, there is not uh, employment. Without employment, there is no economic growth. Um, and for in the industrialization, again, where the Commonwealth countries uh, could, could come in is invest and counter also the Chinese uh, 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 you know, investment policies that have been going on in the continent for the last uh, 20 years. Uh, because if you can measure uh, the, the amount of investment that the Chinese companies have done, or government vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the West, it's, it's again disproportionate and industrialization is in every sector, mm -hmm. from agriculture to food processing uh, to uh, mineral processing. I mean, even when we're speaking about um, um, uh, green, uh, green technologies, batteries, 80% uh, of global lithium production is in, uh, in China. Why can't we invest in uh, lithium processing or other uh, uh, mineral processing on the continent? That is the future. And the West, the uh, Commonwealth countries have the technology. It requires uh, viable projects uh, to be put together to be de developed and private with the government sector uh, helped to be implemented on the ground. Mm. Uh, and Julia, do you, do you rec recognize what Atanas is saying there? I know you uh, invest in lots of big infrastructure projects, but what's the role of uh, technology and digital investment as well? Well, as, as well as the larger infrastructure projects, and we, we do uh, tend to invest on a greenfield basis, so um, really from scratch. Um, we are now investing in a, a string of data centers um, across a number of African countries, um, from Kenya, Uganda, um, Ethiopia, and a, a number of others. And we see this as a critical part of the future infrastructure of Africa as we move into the, the, the more digital age, we must have places where we can store, where we can process data. And as well as the importance of investing in, in large hydro stations or geothermal plants, investing in data centers we see as a very, very key part of our activity. Um, there's a, a slightly different uh, investment profile in that we would tend to have rather more private sector than public sector off-takers. 
but but we think the uh, the Rexia brand that that that, that we use is, is one that is going to be critical to mm. Africa's future. Mm. Uh, and I know you want to come in. Uh, you've uh, invested in fintech, of course. I'd love to hear your experience um, about that, Toyin, and where you think the opportunities are and indeed the challenges as well when it comes to things like fintech investment in Africa. Thank you. So um, with um, a 1.2 billion population and a predominantly young population and a population that is largely financially excluded, obviously the for me, the only bridge that I can see between these huge numbers of young people and the economic opportunities that um, wealthy nations like um, Commonwealth, I mean, uh, the, uh, some of our Commonwealth brothers um, have is through financial tech, is through technology, um, is through financial literacy, is through very, very much digital technology. And this is what can create and has created some of the unicorns we've had out of Africa. And we at Emerging Africa have invested in technology companies, both directly by way of equity investment. We have a FinTech subsidiary um, that we hold controlling shares in, but also we have raised debt and we have also um, funded directly um, other tech companies. And we've seen the impact um, that it's making. So it's a huge opportunity for everybody to invest in Africa. Mm. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to move uh, the conversation on slightly now to something else, something a bit more controversial, I, I would say. Um, there's always a, a balance to be struck. It's often seen as a conflict between economic growth, uh, investment and markets and social and environmental goals as well. Um, when it comes to energy, it's, it's a case in point. Over 700 million Africans uh, had no access to electricity in 2019. That's according to the International Energy Agency. So we know access to energy is a massive uh, issue, but energy is also contentious in that, you know, when you speak about things like fossil fuels, green energy, is there a place for fossil fuels uh, when it comes to investment and growth in Africa, or do we need to, must we shift towards uh, green energy? Uh, energy. Uh, Atanas, I'd love to hear your views on how this balance can be struck, this balance between economic growth and social and environmental considerations. Thank you. Um, well, I have, I have a very, very clear view because uh, we are experiencing the challenges of building one of Africa's or Angola's uh, most important industrial project and we're investing in a one billion dollar modular latest technology oil refinery. Probably we are the only people crazy enough uh, together with uh, Mr. Dangote in Nigeria to build a refinery in Angola or in Africa. And the challenges are that the fact that when we went to financial institutions to ask for funding, uh, the only funding for project that we got was from African, Pan-African developmental uh, financial institutions and none of the US or Commonwealth uh, uh, partners refused to give us because they don't do carbon investment. Although our project is carbon neutral using the latest gas capture uh, uh, technology, it brings jobs, inclusion, it brings energy security into Angola and it cuts so much CO2 emission of ships having to go from Angola to China exporting the crude and ships having to go from Europe into Angola bringing the refined products. It makes so much sense and yet the view that we get is black and white. No, we don't do or we do. And unfortunately you cannot approach energy security industrial growth and revolution in Africa with such a black and white uh, approach. You need to have nuances. You need to, the, 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 the West financial institutions, they need to have the flexibility to allow for certain projects in Africa to, uh, uh, to fit within that framework, right? Because you cannot have energy or you cannot have industrial growth without energy in Africa. And unfortunately, technologically, 
you cannot have energy security and energy sufficiency purely on renewables. We all know that. But these truths, this mathematics, this empirical data needs to be recognized and certain nuances need to be allowed for to be included into, uh, for the Africa continent. Otherwise, without energy security, you are not going to have the industrial growth that we all require. Uh, Julia, what, what are your views on this, um, especially, uh, you know, Atanas is saying there's not enough nuance um, that, is, that is had in the conversation around investment in carbon or, or, or completely green. Where do you think we should be focusing? Is there space for some carbon investment? Should we allow some? Well, I'll, I'll come back to your point about balance in mm. between. Uh, ESG and economic growth. I mean, as uh, we are a 25-year investor, we do not sell our assets. We haven't sold a single asset since we were set up in 2006. And this gives us um, a view that all ESG issues are integrated throughout the life of our investments. Now, these cover, obviously, a whole series of environmental issues, and we look to those and as in terms of longer term investments and see the way that the, the, the world is looking at decarbonization. Now, within the, we have a particular focus on renewable investment and a whole, a whole range, as I've said already, from um, solar to hydro to, to geothermal. And we believe that there are a huge number of opportunities to promote this type of investment across uh, Africa, and I think we're being supported by the international financial institutions uh, that we work with very closely. In addition to that, I think that the more um, individual uh, solar packages that can be uh, made available to individuals across Africa will also enable a degree of that energy um, security for individuals. Energy security for industrial entities, I think, is another matter that we've been looking at in relation to storage. And although we haven't yet um, set up one in Africa, we have actually invested in a uh, new hydrogen storage using uh, energy electrolyzed, and then we have storage from that. So I don't think, I mean, on the whole, as I said, we have the focus on the uh, low carbon investment or low or no carbon investment. And we have, well, everything is very difficult to make it absolutely zero carbon, um, rather than uh, carbon uh, mm. intensive industries. Yeah, uh, Toyin. I feel very passionate about this, and I have to speak up. I have lived in Africa all of my 57 years. Um, I have suffered the pains of the low pace of industrialization in Africa. The reality is that we need a combination of both alternatives to give us the solutions that we need. So in our rural areas, um, I absolutely support um, the um, solutions that we can get from um, the renewables. And so I sit on the investment committee of the Off-Grid Energy Inclusion Fund for Africa, um, sponsored by the Africa Development Bank. And I support all the funding that we are pushing out there for um, the solar you know, um, and other renewables. But in terms of the needs of industrial Africa, cities like Lagos, we cannot wait until we are able to deploy renewables. We need today to continue to provide grid um, backed energy from hydro back carbon and wherever the power is we need to get it to develop Africa. We cannot wait. Mm. Uh, and of course, it's not just the environment. There's also social um, considerations Absolutely. as well to yeah. be made. And I know that Absolutely. you, um, of, of course, are very passionate about women uh, in investment and you've set up Women in Finance Nigeria and also here as well. So I'd love to hear um, how you're factoring in those more social goals as well in your work. Thank you. So um, in Africa and indeed in the whole of the world, we have 50% uh, of the population made up of women. Unfortunately, these women, not just in Africa, but again across the world, are disproportionately financially included and empowered, and we need to fill the gap. 
And if we're going to fill the gap, we're going to need to have initiatives to build capacity for these women. We're going to need to have initiatives to create platforms for these women to network and to um, collaborate and to build wealth. And we're going to need specialized funding for women. I had the privilege of um, presenting the first um, gender um, focused investment vehicle to the Nigeria Stock Exchange a couple of years back. And recently, again, we have introduced another balanced diversity fund. And these funds essentially invest in the stocks of companies or securities of companies that can demonstrate significant representation of women across um, board management and the staff. And incidentally, these funds and these companies tend to outperform others. So it's a very clear case of um, putting our money in a good place mm. and to do good. So I am an um, unapologetic um, <laughs> advocate of all forms of um, gender inclusion and gender diversification on boards and management and companies. And we are currently incubating a female entrepreneur fund mm. um, that will be Pan-African. And I would love as many people as can crowd in with us to create many more such platforms so that we can have the growth that we need in our um, yeah. continent. Uh, and Atanas, as the only man uh, on uh, the panel, I'd love to <laughs> hear your views on this and not to put you on the spot, but uh, Toyin is right. It's not just a case of, you know, in including women and it makes us feel nice and we can pat ourselves on the back. Actually, there's a business case to be made. Um, we know that when more women are educated, for example, you know, economies thrive, that they thrive much more than um, when female education is lower. So this we need women, we need to, to women to be included in, uh, in these conversations for when we're talking about economic growth. I fully agree. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, we uh, thank, thank you for that. And uh, even at GEMCORP, if you look at our board, uh, board composition, you know, more than 50% of is uh, composed by women professionals that have worked with, uh, with me for more than uh, a decade. Um, it's, it's also about, uh, uh, you know, when, when you look at the empowerment of uh, uh, women or financial inclusion, uh, it's all about also improving governance uh, in, in Africa, right? You need to, you know, one of the biggest, the biggest uh, challenges that, uh, that we see day to day is that, as my uh, partners here on the panel said, um, is that a lot of the projects die too, too quickly or they don't reach a, a financial close or financially investable type of uh, stage because the local investment teams, the local uh, leaders, the lot, local entrepreneurs, they just simply don't know how to do it, right? They simply lack the, 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 the skill set or the experience that we here in the Western world have. And it is literally as little as, as simple as helping them put a financial model together or a financial pitch together, helping them explain how a corporate governance should be done, right? The way Western institutions, auditors, uh, stakeholders, investors require it to see. And making that bridge is critical, right? And that bridge is from women inclusion, financial inclusion, education, um, providing the, the, the internships, providing the technology, the skill set. So it's, it's about being there and literally helping, grabbing those people by the arms and guiding them how it needs to be done. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've got about seven minutes left, so uh, Julia, I, I want to just go uh, run through the panel for any closing remarks you have, and just going back to that question, uh, the Africa opportunity is the topic of this uh, session, so I, I would like to hear your final sort of closing remarks about what does the Africa opportunity look like, and uh, where should, the, where, what's the role of the Commonwealth and bodies like the Commonwealth uh, Trade and Investment sub Summit in ensuring that we can reach the goals that we all share here uh, for African growth? Yeah, well, that's a very full question. I shall, <laughs> I shall answer it in parts. Um, I, I, 
As I said at the beginning, the, the Africa opportunity is very considerable from our point of view, but we, we are trying now to focus on areas whereby we can uh, promote and develop infrastructure so that we don't have that falling by, falling by the wayside. And I think it's a very key part of looking at how the opportunity can be made greater. Um, the whole issue of, of capacity building, getting projects um, from concept to shovel, is one that needs a, a terrific amount of focus and terrific amount of work. Often it's not so much the money, it's making the proposition available for investors and bringing in those investors that, that, that we've talked about that look at the risks of being too great at the moment. And I think this is an area that the Commonwealth can really help with because due to the, the network um, structure of the Commonwealth, it can bring experience from a number of different countries together one of the ways in which we're, we're doing it as an organization, we're working with the Global Infrastructure Hub and the World Economic Foundation, we've created something called the Africa Infrastructure Fellowship Program. And I believe this is indicative of the way that the Commonwealth could also work together, whereby we bring practitioners from public procurement, work with private sector companies, have a degree of, um, of uh, exposure both to companies and to uh, academic um, uh, background to bring up a, a, a I don't want to use a card, cadre is the wrong word, so it's my, a, a, a group of uh, professionals who can really help with this whole capacity building approach. And to the extent that we could have that type of, 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 of network, I think it would be really beneficial in terms of creating great opportunity for all. Mm. Uh, and, and Toy, and your final thoughts? So my final thoughts are that the Africa opportunity is attractive, it's compelling, um, it is not risk-free. And um, from uh, our position as Africans, African governments and private sector, there is what to do. I do believe that um, concerns around um, volatility of currency, um, convertibility and transferability of the proceeds of investments do need to be addressed um, by more policy stability at our end. Um, government guarantees were um, appropriate, perhaps also um, viability guarantee funds and those kind of initiatives will be supportive, but there is a big role for the private sector to play and that's where emerging Africa capital plays, which is to support these domestic issuers and domestic um, companies and governments to ensure that these projects are um, viable, they're bankable, um, and they're properly structured to attract foreign investments. And please, let the investments flow. Um, a study by McKinsey found that in terms of appetite for African investments, um, there is much more from outside the Commonwealth than there is from within the Commonwealth. And um, that's something that, like Atenas put it, we need to put our money where our mouth is and be consistent with, with our commitment. Thank you. And Atenas, your final words. Um, thank you. I would, I would reiterate uh, what I said at the beginning. Um, Africa opportunity is not the future, it is happening now and the Commonwealth uh, nations and institutional investors need to address this opportunity and the challenges uh, with an urgency. And what does it mean? It means, in my opinion, that the biggest stumbling block is the allocation of capital because genuinely there is scarcity capital allocated to the African opportunity and that we can see every day even when you look at the government bonds of Africa, where they transact or where they trade today at mid 15% returns on average, relative to Western governments, it's, it's, it's just not comparable. And how a private companies going to borrow, at what interest rates private companies are going to borrow in Africa when your government is trading or borrowing at the market at 15%. That means that the premium that private companies need to borrow at is more than 15%. Yeah. But there are no forms of sustainable private company business that can sustain borrowing costs at 20%. This is the simple truth and the simple maths. And the only way we're going to bring down borrowing costs for governments is when more institutional capital is allocated. Yeah. 
to Africa. And that needs to come as a policy. And when that is addressed, my plea then is for institutional investors across those governments to work with companies like ours and the companies of my partners here that have multi-year, decade experience in investing in Africa according to Western standards and help deploy that capital where it's needed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that is it. We're right on time. So I have about one minute to wrap up. Thank you so much to uh, my panel, Ju Julia Prescott from Meridium, Toyin Asani from Emergent Africa Group, and Atanas Bostandiev from GEMCORP. And of course, we had uh, Dr. Uh, James Mwangi speak and giving, uh, giving opening remarks from Equity Group Holdings. I think you've all made an extremely compelling case for why uh, investing in Africa makes very good sense uh, and why uh, meetings like this are crucial to make sure that that Africa opportunity is seized on. So thank you very much. And if we could just give the panel a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mercy. Thanks very much to all the panelists. Don't worry, you're free to go. Uh, you, you, you don't have to stay there. Um, we, uh, you, however, are not free to go. Not yet. Uh, we are almost done. Uh, we have one more session. We have the closing session of the Commonwealth Trade Investment Summit 2022. I'm just waiting for the go-ahead. There's no thumbs up just yet, but I will very shortly be asking Lord Marlins to take the stage, who will be running the final hour of the summit. Do not go anywhere. All right, and we're good to go. Lord Marland, Chairman of the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council. He'll be running the show. Lord Marlon, the floor is yours. A very hard act to follow, if I may say so. Thank you very much indeed. Um, hi, Commissioner. Uh, would you like to come and take a seat at the front here on this table here? Justin, no, Zach, you can stay here because I'm going to be very, very uh, short and sweet as the room starts to fill up, because they know you're here, Zach. Um, that means, that doesn't say we're in a Chinese restaurant, it says, come and sit down here quickly. Uh, just give us two minutes, everybody. There'll be a bit of an influx. Who? Well, he'll just have to keep a seat for him. session and uh, what a wonderful way to finish it to have the new Commonwealth Minister of State to uh, give us the benefit of his views. Uh, Zach Goldsmith is almost a household name because um, of uh, his great green credentials 
uh, and the wonderful things he's done for the sustainability in this country. Uh, he came with me to Malta in advance of Chogham, and then he got stolen away to become a mayoral candidate, I think it was Zach. And so sadly, you haven't been engaging with the Commonwealth much since then, but now you're back in full force and vigor, and how lucky we are to have him speaking to us now. So please, a Commonwealth welcome for Zach Goldsmith. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Jonathan. It was nearly a decade ago, and I, if I remember, it was a long time ago. I have a feeling my, my speech that I actually delivered bore no resemblance whatsoever to the topic I'd been invited to speak about, but I got a very polite round of applause all the same, and I'd be appreciated if I could have another one at the end of this one. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for the intro. Thank you to the Commonwealth uh, Enterprise and Investment Council for pulling this incredible summit together and bringing together this just immeasurably valuable family of nations. I understand, I've just heard that you have, over the last two days, you've had 31 countries represented here, which is really a staggering feat. <coughs> and it is wonderful to see so many of you. And Your Excellency, I saw a second ago, it's lovely to see you as well. And thank you for sponsoring uh, one of the prizes. Um, th I know this has been a, a, a fantastic opportunity to boost investment and trade partnerships and, and to look for all the opportunities for joint ventures that undoubtedly exist. And I know that innovation and great ideas have been right at the forefront of this summit. And we're going to see in a few moments uh, one of the uh, recipients of uh, today's uh, a a Green Business Award, Planet Green Africa, well-deserved recipient. Th they work to effectively take a problem and turn it into a lucrative solution. They turn agricultural waste into fuel, which is exactly the kind of innovation and effort that the world needs, not only supporting a clean and renewable energy and helping that transition that we all have signed up to in various ways, but boosting Malawi's economy and promoting opportunities for women as well. Another example, I believe they're here today, is Tingo, uh, who provide farmers in Nigeria with the a smartphone a platform that they need in order to reach out to international markets. There is just so much good work going, across, uh, going on across the Commonwealth, and we're absolutely determined in the UK, and me in my new capacity as Minister for the Commonwealth, to ensure that all of us, new members and old, are able to tap into and benefit from that work. The UK government's new Developing uh, Countries Trading Scheme is part of that. I'm sure you are aware of it. It's designed to cut the red tape to make it cheaper and easier for countries across the Commonwealth to export their goods and products to the United Kingdom. And it's win-win. Our householders here in the UK get lower prices, um, <clears throat> more choice, but the countries engaging in that trade benefit through increased trade. And we're working to make that scheme more generous and we're working to, re to lower those barriers that exist still further. We're supporting the small island developing states. I'm always told off when I use that term because most of them are huge ocean states, but technically they are small island developing states, helping them to strengthen their resilience to climate change, including through a 36 million pounds sustainable blue economies program. And our development finance institution, the British International Investment is doing some incredible work in Commonwealth countries right across Africa and Asia in partnership with the private sector, including a number of organizations that are here today. Now, BII is tasked with driving finance towards countries and regions that really need it, and to do it in a way that also addresses uh, so many other challenges that we face, not least climate change, which for all of us is existential, but for small island developing states and the climate vulnerable countries, it is particularly acute as a threat. Now, as COP26 presidents, the UK last year moved mountains in order to bring nature from the uh, margins of the debate on climate change and put it right at the heart of our collective response to it. And we did that because there is no credible pathway to net zero. There is no solution to climate change, no way we can stay within one and a half degrees unless we massively escalate our efforts to protect and restore the natural world. And despite that, and we think that nature has anything up to 50% 
uh, uh, to offer. 50% of the problem can be solved through working differently with the natural world. Around a third of emissions come from poor use of land, land degradation. But despite that colossal role of nature, both negative and positive, we spend about 2% of global climate finance on nature. So at COP26, we really set out to try and uh, change that. But it's more even than climate change. Uh, nature is self-evident the source of everything we have. It's the source of everything we need. And as we erode and destroy natural systems, then we begin to lose those free services that nature provides, clean and reliable water, fertile soils, drought and flood prevention, and so much more besides. So increasingly, we've made nature-based solutions a core focus as well of BII, along with the entirety of our uh, ODA portfolio. And this includes BII's uh, more recent pledge to invest around $200 million in hydropower projects across Africa, helping to meet energy, energy demands of, of around 3 million people. The joint venture uh, is expected to support the creation of nearly 200,000 jobs, avoid at least 270,000 tons of CO2, and provide enough clean electricity to meet the equivalent demand of over 3 million people. Now, so far this year, BII has already uh, delivered $500 million in climate investments around the world, including to a great many Commonwealth partners. For example, the Africa Forestry Impact Platform, which promotes the sustainable growth of the sector while reducing deforestation and improving livelihoods across sub-Saharan Africa. BII has also set a target for a quarter of all new investments to promote projects that support women, empowering women and girls to play their full and critically important roles in the economy. And that includes a recent investment in a female-led fintech company, Kinada Capital, uh, to open up affordable finance for entrepreneurs across India. Now, over the next five years, BII will continue to expand its work across more Commonwealth nations, particularly in the Indo-Pacific and Caribbean, with a focus on green investments. And across the full range of our diplomatic and development work, the UK is committed to improving our offer to Commonwealth partners, to doing more to work with you, promoting innovation, boosting trade, championing investment, tackling shared challenges, not least challenges like climate change. The Commonwealth is the greatest club in the world. It's a family of diverse and wonderful nations. The success of one is the success of all. And I'm completely determined, as I know my friend Jonathan here is, that we in the UK will do absolutely everything we can to support that family using all the tools we have at our disposal and to tackle some of the single greatest challenges we've ever faced as a species, but to do so together. Thank you so much for having me today and congratulations to those who've won the prize. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Zach, and um, it's great to hear the commitment of the UK government, and uh, I know that we're in safe hands with you, uh, and um, uh, it's great that you are the new minister for it, and congratulations. Now, um, as, as many of you will know, I was privileged to be able to announce at um, uh, Glasgow COP uh, that uh, the Bangladeshi uh, Prime Minister was sponsoring a prize in name of her father and also uh, Sheikh Hasina's drive for green and sustainable energy. And uh, we were tasked, the CWIC was, uh, of setting up a panel, which I'm so grateful to my friend Justin Mundy for chairing. He, of course, was uh, Prince of Wales's, then Prince of Wales's sustainability czar and has been an advisor to the World Bank and things like that on sustainability, has been at the forefront of it for years, so he kind of knows what he's talking about um, most of the time. Um, and uh, I'm also incredibly grateful to the High Commissioner, uh, Saida Muna, who has really pushed us very hard to make sure this happened and has done a brilliant job on behalf of her country here and of course the great Salman Rahman who is with us, uh, who has been the person who has gathered together the funds to uh, make this prize happen and uh, we're very, very privileged to be involved in such a prestigious award. Uh, but first, before we present the award, 
Saira Muna, I'd love you to come up and say a few words, if you would. And then after that, I'd like um, Salman to come up uh, afterwards. And then Justin will finish off. Thank you very much. I'll go here. Yeah, just go up to the podium. That's lovely. Thank you. The Honourable Advisor to Bangladesh Prime Minister for Private Industry and Investment, His Excellency Mr. Salman Ifrahman, the Right Honourable Lord Goldsmith, uh, His Majesty's Government's Minister for FCDO for Commonwealth, uh, Overseas Territories, Climate, Energy, Environment, uh, Lord Marlon of Ostok, a very odd man from an odd place, um, but our great friend and the Chair of CWEIC, <laughs> Yes, well, I was just following your sense of humor. And, um, <laughs> and Mr. Justin Mundy, who's not yet here, but he was the chair of the jury board for this award, and the winner of uh, the first Bangabundu, uh, the first Commonwealth Bangladesh Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman Green Investment Award from Malawi. Congratulations to you, the last one. And our uh, members of our Federation for Business, Chamber and Commerce who are traveling from Bangladesh, as well as every, every distinguished participant in this uh, really, really wonderful Commonwealth Trade Investment Summit. Assalamu alaikum. As you're aware, as Lord Marlin just mentioned, that uh, as High Commissioner of Bangladesh to the United Kingdom and as member of the Board of Governors in the Commonwealth, this is a very proud moment for me and for my country and very proud moment for planet Earth as well. Um, as member of the Commonwealth, we have been pursuing four agenda in the Commonwealth, and we are so proud that today we have amongst us the Commonwealth Minister from, uh, and after he's become assigned this responsibility, this is the first time I meet him, so congratulations, mm -hmm. Lord Goldsmith, on this wonderful portfolio that you have. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are pursuing climate under the leadership of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. She was the president of Climate Vulnerable Forum during COP26, and Lord Jack Goldsmith did participate in one of the dialogues that our High Commission had organized last year. And we were the CVA president, we were engaging with COP26, demanding that emissions be cut, otherwise we cannot survive. Our survival depends on the emissions cuts and rest, arrest the 1.5 degrees. And I remember he said, and I brought a quote, we are absolutely committed both to listening and to amplifying the voices of climate vulnerable nations and to working with Bangladesh and partners to deliver the highest possible ambition and the resilient recovery that we now need. And thank you for that support at COP26, CVF of COP26 really, really collaborated, and there at that forum, Lord Marland and Commonwealth Secretary General announced this award. Um, why is this a glorious day for us? Because this award is named after the founding father of Bangladesh, who the BBC has rated as the greatest Bengali of all time. Because after the British had left us in 1947 with Pakistan, there was only one country that fought a liberation war and became independent, and that was Bangladesh. So the greatest Bengali of all time and the undisputed leader of Bengali freedom movement, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and I'd like to pay my tribute to him for that. Um, in 2018, when Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina came to the uh, London Shogam, there, uh, she had committed to two things. She was very inspired by Her Late Majesty, and she dedicated, and I quote from her speech, the people of Bangladesh joined me in congratulating the Queen and are dedicating to her under the project Queen's Commonwealth Canopy, a small sal forest in Pirganj in Thakurgaon district in Bangladesh. This has connected Bangladesh to the initiative taken under the Queen's Canopy of preserving rainforest and endangered forest in the Commonwealth space. The sal forest is a very special tree. It is dedicated to the, some tribal goddess. It's a very holy tree. It is found only in three countries in the world, Bangladesh, India, and Nepal. Perhaps it has something to do with Buddhism, but that was brought under by Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina under the Queen's canopy. The other thing she committed is 
As you know that she has quadrupled Bangladesh's GDP four times from 2009 to 2022, under 100 billion to 430 billion US dollars. She is a prime minister with a business agenda. And that is why in 2018, when the Commonwealth, London Commonwealth Chogum uh, set the target of 2 trillion US dollars of inter-Commonwealth trade, she volunteered to take the lead of Commonwealth business to business connectivity agenda. And since then, Bangladesh has been leading the B2B connectivity agenda in the Commonwealth. We've organized from the High Commission three conferences on that, and we are very pleased to participate at the Commonwealth CWIC Trade Investment Summit. So she took the lead in B2B, and currently we are working towards that goal. And of course, the other two agenda is women, uh, empowering women within the Commonwealth, girls' education, and mental health. So with all these four agenda, we are very pleased that this year, when our commitment to climate and climate vulnerability and three alliances that we've joined the United Kingdom, including the one that Lord Goldsmith is pursuing, uh, the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People, we've just joined it this year. Before that, we joined the, uh, the Ambition uh, Action Alliance with the United Kingdom, as well as the Oceans Alliance 3030. With all these alliances, we look forward to taking our common aspirations for having a greener planet. And I hope this award, which I take great pride in that I could do this as High Commissioner, Commissioner, would really inspire other Commonwealth countries to come forward. Congratulations once again to Mr. Um, the Planet Green Africa from Malawi. And I hope this award will enhance Bangladesh's trade and business relationship with African countries. After all, this is the age of Asia, uh, not only Asia, but this is the age of Africa. So we hope a great Asia Alliance, Asia-Africa Alliance will be built within the Commonwealth with this award. Thank you very much. And thank you to Lord Marland. Uh, Salman, please. Justin, would you mind just coming up on the stage as well so that you can take, finish off after uh, Salman? Thank you. Thank you. Saadi, come and sit here, please. What did you call me earlier? I, I, might, just, I might just push you off the stage. Um, <laughs> the Right Honourable Lord Goldsmith, uh, Minister for Overseas Territories and the Commonwealth of His Majesty's Government. My dear friend, Lord uh, Jonathan Marlin, Chairman of the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council, Her Excellency Saida Munat Asneen, High Commissioner of Bangladesh to the UK, Mr. Justice Mundi, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to you all. It is an honor for me to be representing my Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, at the first Commonwealth Bangladesh Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman Green Investment Award organized by the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council during this very successful Commonwealth Trade and Investment Summit 2022. And I would really like to congratulate uh, uh, Lord Marlin for this, having this very successful uh, summit. I begin by paying my respects to Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II who served as head of the Commonwealth for seven decades with utmost dedication and dignity. My very best wishes also to His Majesty King Charles III, who has already taken exceptional leadership in championing climate and business in the Commonwealth. <coughs> On this special occasion, I pay my profound homage to our father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, whose 23 years of freedom struggle led Bangladesh to independence in 1971. It was Bangabandhu who laid the foundation of a vibrant and value-based diplomatic relationship with the United Kingdom during his historic meeting on 8th January 1972 at number 10 with Conservative Prime Minister Sir Edward Heath. This was when he was actually released from prison from Pakistan and on his way to uh, Bangladesh, it was a stop over he made in London and had the opportunity of meeting Prime Minister Heath at that time. So it was a very, very historic moment for both our countries. <clears throat> it was Bangabandhu who led Bangladesh's membership to the Commonwealth on 18th April 1972. Bangabandhu was a visionary leader from the global south who dedicated his life to promoting democracy, freedom, peace, justice, and tolerance, values that are core to the Commonwealth. 
Protecting the environment and nature was central to Bangabandhu's golden Bengal vision. The government of Bangladesh is therefore grateful to the CWEIC and the Commonwealth, in particular the Lord Marland of Wattstock, Chairman of CWEIC, and Baroness Patricia Scotland, Secretary General of the Commonwealth, for very befittingly launching the Bangabandhu Green Investment Award at the COP26 last year in the, presence, in the presence of the Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Her Excellency Sheikh Hasina. I also want to thank Her Excellency Saida Muna Tasni, Bangladesh High Commissioner to the UK and the Commonwealth, for her innovative initiative to propose a Green Investment Award at the Commonwealth to honor the life and legacy of a great leader on the 50th anniversary of Bangabandhu's membership to the Commonwealth. And I would also like to thank her just as uh, Lord Marlin said, for pursuing the, after launching it, for pursuing this, for this to happen today. So thank you very much, High Commissioner. <clears throat> I'm delighted to inform the, uh, the summit that the Bangladesh Investment Development Authority under our Prime Minister's office has joined the CWEIC as its official strategic member since last year. As the Commonwealth's business-to-business -business connectivity Lead, lead country, Bangladesh looks forward to strengthening its partnership with CWEIC's global network to accelerate our actions one step closer to the intra-commonwealth trade target of dollars, two trillion US dollars by 2030. Dear friends, over the past one decade, under the visionary leadership of our Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, Bangladesh has leapfrogged itself into South Asia's fastest growing economy with an average growth rate of over 6.5%. In 2019, our pre-COVID growth was 8.2%. And even in the post-COVID, our economy of 165 million people recovered at 6.5% last year. According to the Boston Consulting Group, HSBC, and UK Center for Business and Economic Research, CEBR's 2022 projections, Bangladesh currently is the world's 32nd largest economy, is on track to emerge a trillion dollar economy by 2040. But our growth will not be at the cost of our environment. Bangladesh's commitment to a just and secure energy transition to a low carbon economy remains unwavering. Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, as the president of the 56th member Climate Vulnerable Forum at the COP26 not only demanded major emission cuts by developed nations, but also set an example by cancelling 10 coal-based uh, coal, uh, coal power plants in Bangladesh. Alongside our high growth projections, she has also adopted the Bangladesh Delta Plan 2100 uh, 20, for sustainable water resources and unfolded the Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan decade 2030 for transition to a low carbon development pathway. We are also aiming for a 40% renewable energy by 2041 through carbon budgeting, decarbonization of manufacturing pathways and low carbon industrialization, Bangladesh today boasts 171 US lead green apparel factories, the highest in the world, with 44 platinum and 94 gold, an unmatched credential in green apparel growth. As you are aware, uh, Bangladesh is one of Bangladesh's uh, main strength of the economy is our textile sector and our apparel growth. And recently, what we have now uh, been doing is, as you know, the circular economy is what is coming into being. And we have want to make Bangladesh into the recycling hub of the world. And the reason for this is that in pre-production waste, we are the highest uh, Bangladesh, you know, produces a huge amount of pre-production waste. And already a number of large recycling companies from America, from Europe, have set up, uh, uh, have established uh, recycling plants. And I think this is something which uh, for the green economy is going to be very, very beneficial. 
At the Commonwealth, where 34 of the 56 members' country are LDCs, LLDCs, SID, small states, or CVF countries, PM, uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, as the CVF president, created the first CVF Commonwealth Climate Prosperity Partnership at the COP26 with the Commonwealth Green Climate Financing Hub. At Kigali, along with Rwanda, Bangladesh pursued mainstreaming of mental health at the heart of the Commonwealth's climate agenda. It is in, the, it is in this spirit that today, as Bangladesh's investment and private industry minister, it makes me truly happy to see that CWEIC's independent judges panel has selected a green agriculture uh, recycle business from a landlocked African country toward the first Commonwealth Bangladesh Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman Green Investment Award. I hope the Bangabandhu Green Investment Award will continue to inspire more SMEs from across the Commonwealth to innovate and engender green technologies for a sustainable and greener future. I really would like to uh, offer my heartiest congratulations to the winner and would like to thank the uh, jury board as well as the CWEIC for uh, all the logistics uh, which was needed for making this uh, award possible today. I hope the spirit of Bangabandhu, Mujib, the eternal, will live on with this, <coughs> with this award across the Commonwealth. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangabandhu, thank you all very much, and it has really been a pleasure to be here with you all today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Salman, you've been a great friend to us, and uh, we're so grateful for the support that you've given uh, our organization. <laughs> And as I said earlier, it was a privilege. I'm now going to ask Justin Mundy, who's a great expert and has spent a huge amount of time with my team selecting from this panel, which has been exciting to describe um, the award and then with Zach, pleased to present the award to the winner. Um, but Justin, over to you for a few minutes. Let's sit down for a second. Your Excellency Honorable Advisor, Excellency High Commissioner, Lord Marland, Lord Coldsmith, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed and honoured guests. Um, I realise that we are indebted to the High Commissioner for having led with such uh, strength the uh, determination to have this award, uh, and we are indebted to her for that. Also, I realise I am indebted to her because I have yet to write my Christmas card to Lord Marland, and I now know the address to which it should be sent. So I can't thank you enough. It's going to be a wonderful joy to see if a Christmas card gets to the odd man from an odd place in wheelchair, so thank you for that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it was a great honor and a privilege to be chair of the advisory panel and it was a remarkable set of really innovative and interesting um, suggestions which were put forward. I'm sure many of you have done this before and you slightly sort of wonder what is going to come upon your plate. I was enormously surprised and really delighted that from around the Commonwealth such fascinating ideas should have been brought up and should be doing so much good. And the fact that there is only one prize winner today is by no means in any way um, deleterious to the other fantastic uh, uh, projects which are going on, all of which will have a very significant impact. But uh, on behalf of the judging panel, I am delighted to announce that this year's winner of the Commonwealth Bangladesh Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib, Mujib Rahman Green Investment Award goes to, as you will have heard, Planet Green Africa, and I'm delighted too that Manbure Kempeze is here representing Mawari Kempeze, who is the CEO of Planet Green Africa. And it gives me great pleasure for him to ask him to come up on the stage and also for Lord Goldsmith to give the award. Thank you very much. Here he comes. Well done. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Thank you. Go around the other side, Justin. You go around next to it. Do you want to
Yeah. I'm disappointed with 6.9% growth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Well, it remains for me now to um, uh, close the show, as it were, and to thank, firstly, all of you for coming. Uh, it's uh, you who make this event, and uh, it's been an extraordinary turnout from 31 countries across the world uh, and states, which is a testament itself to the Commonwealth. I want to thank Zenith Bank, uh, Jim Ovia, who's not with us, but I hopefully we'll see him later, TPP, our uh, great uh, health tech friends from Leeds, and of course, Tingo Mobile from um, Africa, Nigeria, who've been so generous to make this event possible. And it wouldn't, of course, be possible without the Lord Mayor and the Alderman and uh, members of the Lord Mayor and Guildhall staff who have given of their premises. And I can see a former Lord Mayor, one of our great supporters, Alan Yarra in the front, who's made so much of this possible uh, for us over the last um, seven or eight years. So please pass on our thanks, Alan, to uh, all the team that have been so supportive. But again, uh, I want to thank you. And because this has been such a great event, I'm happy to announce that we are going to, uh, with the current chair in office, uh, Rwanda, have a another Commonwealth Trade and Investment Summit in Kigali on the 15th and 17th of May. So book your flights now. It'll be a great event. It was a great event in June last year in Rwanda. It's a great place to go to, and uh, I, I look forward to seeing you all there. And those of you that are strategic partners, I look forward to seeing you in a few minutes' time. But thanks to you all for making this such a great event. <laughs>